want to start by just thanking all of you for taking time from what I know is an incredibly busy schedule and a busy time of the year to uh, attend this event and learn a little bit about uh, the issues that we're facing and hopefully provide some insight and direction uh, that we can use as we go forward. Um, we're really grateful to the uh, Coalition for a Healthier Tennessee for providing us with this opportunity today. This is a, an issue that is critically important to East Tennessee. It's critically important to our state. It's also critically important to our nation. We're not the only ones struggling with this in the state. Um, as you know, the, the, the health status of, of East Tennesseans and really all of Tennesseans um, could, could use some improvement. And this issue poses a significant risk both to our economic potential and to the quality of life of those of us that live in this state and in this country. And you know, when you, when you think about it, it's, a, it's an issue that has gotten to a critical point, and the bad news is it has to be addressed. It cannot continue. Now, the good news is I think we can, we can address it if we all work together. You know, we live in an area where, you know, I, I, and I'm going to use myself as an example, I love a good meal. And if it's fried, it's even better, right? And on occasion, I may enjoy an, uh, an adult beverage. You know, I don't use tobacco products, but many of us in, on occasion enjoy a tobacco product, right? And I know I'd much rather sit and watch a volunteer football game than I would getting on a treadmill or going out for a run. So exercise doesn't always make it to the top of my priority list. And I think that's representative of most of us in the room, probably representative of our, of our whole state. And it's creating some significant health care concerns. Um, I want to take a minute you know, while, while the University of Tennessee Medical Center is hosting this, I want to take a minute and acknowledge the entire healthcare provider network in this region. We've got Covenant Health, we've got Tenova Healthcare, we've got East Tennessee Children's Hospital, I see Keith up there, and we have Blunt Memorial Hospital and the University of Tennessee Medical Center. These are good hospitals. These are good health systems. They're run by good people. Even more importantly, the medical staffs of our respective organizations are outstanding. They're passionate about caring for patients, they're passionate about the health and welfare of their patients and this community. What we need to talk about is preventing illness that the things I just mentioned create. We've got to talk about access to health care, and we have to talk about prevention. Part of that ties back to access. And that's what we're here to discuss. Um, we have a number of elected officials here. Uh, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce John Sheridan here in a minute, and he's going to introduce by name those elected officials. But we have representatives from the Tennessee General Assembly. We have representatives from the Knox County Commission. We have representatives from the um, Knoxville City Council. And we have some other elected offices that are represented here today as well. And we appreciate all that you all do for us. We appreciate you taking time to be here and learn about these issues. And we hope that, that the information that we're able to provide today will, will help you in the deliberations and decisions you're going to be asked to make here in the next few, few weeks and few months. Um, the program today really is intended to uh, provide information, but it's also intended to solicit your thoughts and ideas that may help us. So it's supposed to be interactive to a degree. And please give us the benefit of, of your ideas because you all have uh, thoughts concerning these issues, and, and they're valuable. Uh, the program is going to be presented in three parts. The first part will be a presentation on, on data and facts, hopefully to frame up the issue. The second part will be a panel that's going to discuss both the, the economic impact as well as the social impact of the issues that we're facing. And the last is to talk about the Tennessee innovations and, and uh, ideas to address the issue. Okay. So it's, it's funny that we're, we're talking about health issues today, and I'm struggling with a lower back issue. Um, and I've asked uh, Mr. Sheridan to step in for me, because I think once I sit down, I don't want to embarrass myself when I try and get up. John's been with the hospital now 15 years. He joined us in 2000, right after uh, we became an independent organization. Um, prior to that, John worked for decades for the University of Tennessee. He's probably... <laughs> You probably all know him because he's probably asked you for money at some point in, the, in your lives. <laughs> uh, but, but John has developed a broad and deep knowledge of issues that not only the providers face in this industry, but also that our patients face. And he is passionate and committed to helping those. And he's used that knowledge in his role as the Vice President for Government Relations to work with our legislative leaders to help them understand the issues 
to provide them with information and data that helps them make great decisions on behalf of Tennessee. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Mr. Sheridan and he's gonna walk us through the program. Thank you, Joe. And there is, there is no offering today, but we, will, we can't hand out <laughs> pledge cards if we need to. So, uh, but uh, again, I want to uh, echo Joe's uh, welcome and thank all of you for taking time from your schedules to be with us today. We think that we've put together a good program and uh, really appreciate your participation. I do want to recognize that I, I saw a few of them when they came in, so hopefully I won't miss anybody, but uh, we have uh, Senator Frank Nicely with us this morning. Uh, Senator Nicely, thank you for being here. Representative Bill Dunn, uh, is with us and Representative uh, Bob Ramsey. Uh, so we appreciate all of you being with us. I think Senator Becky Massey will be here later today. Uh, Mayor Rojero is here and she will be on the program a little later today. So again, we appreciate uh, all of you being with us and uh, uh, helping us uh, walk through today's program and understand these issues because they will be important as, uh, as the day moves forward. Just a couple of housekeeping things. We will take a break somewhere in the middle of the morning, so uh, and there'll be coffee and uh, juice and water and so forth. There are restrooms outside uh, in the lobby, uh, either just immediately by the registration area or down by the main information desk. So those are a couple of housekeeping, uh, housekeeping items. Uh, to get us started this morning, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Rick Johnson. Uh, Rick is president and chief executive officer of the Governor's Foundation for Health and Wellness. And that, as all of you know, is, a, is leading and directing the statewide initiative towards improving uh, health care in Tennessee. Uh, previously, uh, Rick served as a special assistant to the governor for health affairs and has held a number of, of consulting uh, positions around East Tennessee for a number of years. So at this time, I'd ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Rick Johnson. Thank you, John. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, thanks also to uh, Joe and to the, to the Medical Center for, for hosting us all. Um, it's a great uh, opportunity to come together uh, and talk about some really uh, critical uh, issues and discuss this uh, together as a group. Uh, and you have uh, shown a great deal by getting up and getting out and being here this morning. Um, and, I, and I'm grateful. Um, I want to I want to spend some time talking about uh, why this health cri crisis matters to Tennessee, uh, and then specifically we're going to talk about why it matters to Knoxville and, and, and this region. But first, I guess maybe some of you are thinking, what health crisis? Uh, what are you talking about uh, when you talk about a health crisis? Well, the fact of the matter is the world is facing uh, a health crisis uh, in many parts of the world, and I'm not talking about Ebola or some pandemic caused by a virus. But the fact of the matter is the United States is facing health crisis that actually places us uh, toward the bottom compared to other industrialized nations around the world. And if that weren't bad enough, uh, we're facing a crisis in Tennessee, a state that is one of the least healthy states in the country. Uh, we have ranked in the bottom 10 compared to other states for the last two decades. Since these data were being compiled and reported on an annual basis, Tennessee has ranked somewhere in the bottom 10. As bad as 48 out of 50. No better than 42nd out of 50, which is where we are right now. That's not acceptable. And I know you all know that and believe that. This is a great state. I think most of us who live here, those of us who were born here, thinks this is the greatest place in the world uh, to work, to live, to raise a family, to call home. So how is it okay that it's one of the least healthy states in the country? And what does that mean to us? And what are we going to do about it? And that's really fundamentally what we're going to try to address today. Um, the fact of the matter also is that some parts of Knoxville and some parts of East Tennessee have even worse health outcomes and health rankings than the rest of the state does. What's going on, you know, that's driving all of this? What's, what, what's the origin of this crisis? Let me share a few statistics with you about the volunteer state. One in four adults in Tennessee in self-reported studies surveys say they smoke, one in four. Uh, the U.S. average is about 18%. We're at 
about 25%. Worse than that, one in five high school students in Tennessee smokes. And that's also from a self-reported study, and it doesn't include smokeless tobacco, neither one does. So our use of tobacco products in Tennessee uh, is probably somewhere uh, approaching 27, 28, 29 percent, could even be 30 percent of the population. Um, how about our, um, how about our uh, physical activity? Uh, 37 percent of people in Tennessee in the most recent behavioral risk survey said they get no physical activity at all. More than a third of us, somewhere now approaching almost 40 percent of us, get no physical activity at all. So we're one of the most sedentary states in the country. There are only three other states that uh, have uh, higher rates of sedentary behavior than we do. Um, in the last survey that I just referred to, 34 percent of the population is classified uh, as uh, overweight uh, and 32, 33 percent obese. So almost 70 percent of us uh, have a BMI of 30 or greater. We're, we're of 25 or greater. Sorry, we're 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 overweight or obese to the rate of about 70 percent of the population. So what that means um, is we have uh, ratings near the top when it comes to incidences of behavior-related chronic disease. Type 2 diabetes is at a near epidemic level in this state. 12 percent of the adult population is classified with type 2 diabetes. The numbers of people with lipid profiles with the, with the, with the uh, 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 blood chemistry and the overall indications of tending toward uh, diabetes uh, is an extraordinarily high percentage of the population. Uh, and type 2 diabetes is an extraordinarily painful, difficult, chronic disease to, to live with. Uh, and long term, uh, it results in amputations and in blindness and in any number of other really horrible uh, uh, results. Uh, we have very high rates of, of hypertension and stroke, high rates of cardiovascular disease. Because of our rates of smoking, high rates of COPD and asthma. Um, and, and we have very high rates of several forms of cancer that are directly related to the behaviors that I've been talking about. Uh, none of that's very pretty. None of that's a very easy um, set of facts to listen to. And I, uh, I don't like being the bearer of that kind of bad news. But it's time that we realize this. And it's time that we as people uh, in this great state said, uh, we've got to do something about this. These numbers are not sustainable. Uh, what kind of cost comes from all of that? Uh, there's bound to be a price to pay for all of that. Uh, and the fact of the matter, there is. Uh, the greatest is uh, the price we pay in terms of human suffering. Uh, these chronic diseases that result from these health conditions uh, are tough, as I said, to live with. Uh, they're painful. They're debilitating. Uh, they create um, suffering. They also reduce quality of life. Um, and even if we don't suffer from those kinds of health conditions and diseases, our health-related behaviors just simply uh, don't make us feel as good. We don't have as much energy. We're not as productive. Um, life just is not quite as good as it could be um, if we had uh, some different health-related behaviors. Um, but there's also a significant economic cost, direct and indirect. Our studies say that every year in Tennessee, we spend, as citizens of the state, about $6 billion a year in direct costs to treat and attempt to cure these chronic behavior-related diseases, $6 billion. Uh, that's money that could go to education. It's money that could go to infrastructure. It's money that could go to creating more jobs. We could all sit here and make a good long list of things we could probably figure out we could do as citizens of Tennessee with $6 billion every year, year on year on year. Uh, and so there's a huge econ direct economic cost. There's an indirect cost in lower productivity and higher absenteeism, um, and even in the case of job opportunity and job loss. When industries and, and businesses look at locating in Tennessee, they look at all sorts of things to assess uh, what it would be like to do business and to have employees in the state. Uh, many of those are very positive indicators when they look at them. But they also look at our health rankings, and they also look at the fact that it costs more 
uh, for employee health care coverage in Tennessee, absenteeism is higher, and productivity can be lower as a result of our health conditions. So there's a cost that we pay for that as well. Um, and we can't afford it. You know, we can't sustain it. The state's spending now almost thir about 32 cents of every dollar it spends on anything. Of all the expenditures the state makes, 32 cents of that is going to health care, going to ten care. Um, and that's about as high a percentage of total spend uh, as we've seen uh, in the state's history. And it's up uh, over the last five years uh, by four, five, six uh, percentage points. Um, it overshadows anything else that we, you know, that we spend money on. Uh, these numbers in Tennessee, these numbers in Knoxville and Knox County, you know, these numbers nationally, you know, simply aren't sustainable. So, you know, even if we wanted to say, let's just not do anything about this, let's just let this be the status quo, and I don't think most of you, because you're here this morning, probably feel like that's acceptable, but even if we said that, we aren't going to be able to. We simply aren't going to be able to continue to afford it. Some of our health crisis is driven uh, also by uh, the ability to have access to affordable treatment and cure when we need it. So we have a two-pronged thing we're talking about here, mainly talking about what can we do to influence, to enable and encourage better health-related behavior in Tennessee so that we prevent these chronic diseases from happening. Uh, but also, uh, what are we doing uh, to enable uh, the working poor, uh, people all across the state who need uh, access to care, to be able to get that care when they need it, and to make sure that we're linking that coverage and that care to better health outcomes, but also to a better way of living, to better health-related lifestyle, um, so that we don't just continue to compound this problem. Um, healthcare costs, uh, in, 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 as many of you know, some of you know better than I, over the last couple of decades, uh, as we've continued to remain in the bottom 10 compared to other states, have had a, a, a fairly consistent trajectory up. Um, we've begun to see that cost curve bend in the right direction in recent times. But at the same time, we've seen utilization rates continue to climb. Um, we haven't seen the same bending of the curve in terms of utilization. And that's not really because, frankly, there's been some outbreak of some untreatable disease or some new diagnoses that were moving tens of thousands of people into the healthcare system to try to cover. It's because of the things I've been talking about. About 90 plus percent, well, not about, 90 plus percent of all of our healthcare dollars are spent on treatment and, and cure, uh, less than 10% on prevention. But the things that are causing us to spend that 90 plus percent on treatment and cure are 70%, by some estimates, somewhere between 65 and 70% preventable and driven by behavior, environment, and genetics. And the largest percentage of that percent is behavior um, and, and the environment that influences behavior. So we have to get those, um, those numbers turned the other way. We're upside down in that equation and in those ratios, and, and, and we, have to, we have to get that fixed. Um, so that's the, that's the picture in a nutshell. You're going to hear in a few minutes uh, from uh, health department uh, folks from, from Knox County and from the region who are going to give you a little bit more specific information on Knox County. Uh, and on Knoxville and in this area, um, and I um, so 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 that's the bad news, uh, but there is good news in all this, um, and there there are some really uh, proven ways uh, that we can turn this around and that we can make a difference. It's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be quick. Um, in 1988. Um, 25, 26 years ago. You know what the obesity rate in Tennessee was? Anybody want to guess? It was 10%. So today it's 34, 33, 34%. 
Uh, we more than tripled uh, our, our rate during that period of time, uh, 20, 25 years. Um, we didn't have a problem with a lot of things that we're talking about uh, you know, that, that, in, that, in that time. Um, but over that period of time, a lot of things have changed in our environment and changed in the way we live that are contributing to uh, what we're dealing with. This is not all about individual guilt. I'm not here this morning to try to guilt us all out and, and say this is just all about us being you know, lazy, worthless people. That is not what this message is about at all. Uh, we as human beings uh, have um, lived um, millennia, uh, uh, wired to uh, eat all we could when we could find it because we didn't know when we were next gonna find it. Um, resting whenever we could because we didn't know we were gonna ha when we were going to have to outrun something that was running after us. Um, prone to like sugar, prone to like carbohydrates um, because that's just our physiology. That's just the way we were made. And then, you know, um, in our recent history, we mainly worked a lot at physical jobs. Uh, and we walked a lot, uh, moved a lot uh, in what we did every day. Uh, we ate more fruits and vegetables. Uh, we had a different uh, kind of diet uh, than we have today. Um, but in the last 50 years particularly, life in Tennessee got a lot easier. Um, and really in the last 75 years or so, life got a lot easier. Um, and we started sitting when we work and we started riding from place to place instead of moving to get there. Um, and food became um, pretty available in pretty big portions um, at prices that most of us were blessed to be able to afford to pay for them. Um, and then along came screens and we got fairly addicted to those uh, in a pretty big way. And um, so there's a good deal going on around us and going on in the way we live that actually doesn't encourage and enable us to be as healthy as we need to be. That's just a fact. And I don't think any of us would advocate turning that around and throwing that away overnight. Uh, it is the way we live and there are a lot of good things about it. But we're gonna have to be conscious of that and we're gonna have to make some incremental changes and then in some cases some you know, more significant changes uh, in the environment and in the way we are living our lives uh, in order to make a difference. And we're gonna talk about that in a little more detail in a little while as well. So, um, that's a, that's a look at um, why uh, we have a crisis, what the numbers are that support my saying that. Um, and, um, and we're gonna spend the rest of the morning talking about just what the heck we're gonna do about that. Uh, but before we do that, uh, Martha and Tara are gonna come up uh, and John, am I, am I, you have some remarks before, I know you're gonna do some introductions. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more now specifically about Knoxville and, and the Knox County and, and Knoxville region. Thank you, Rick. Um, as Rick indicated, what we're going to do now is, is uh, we have two, um, two folks to join us on the program who are going to kind of help frame the issue very specifically as it relates to Knox County and, and to East Tennessee. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Martha Buchanan, who's the director of the Knox County uh, Health Department, and Dr. Tara Sturdivant, who's the regional uh, director and coordinator for the Tennessee Department of Health. Uh, they will uh, kind of present statistics and facts for us about, uh, about Knox County and our region. And as we go along, I'll, I'll speak for them, but uh, I hope uh, if you have questions about any of the, uh, the things that they talk about, uh, there are microphones available uh, or raise your hand, uh, something of that sort, and we'll, uh, we'll try to get your questions answered. So I'd ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Martha Buchanan and Dr. Tara Sturdivant. Thank you, John. Wondered if my boss is in the audience. She's actually the regional director, so just want to, Janet Ridley. Um, I am happy to be with you this morning. Uh, and I'm with the, as uh, John said, I'm with the Tennessee Department of Health, and I'd like to thank our chief medical officer, Dr. David Reagan, for asking me to speak with you this morning. And I'd also like to credit Mr. Eric Harkness, the Commissioner's Health Policy Advisor, for my slides. 
The mission of the Tennessee Department of Health is to protect, promote, and improve the health and prosperity of people in Tennessee. We at the department see health and prosperity as inextricably linked. As an agency, we strive to be a recognized and trusted leader in health, partnering and engaging with our stakeholders to accelerate Tennessee's rise to one of our nation's top 10 healthiest states. When we look at the national health rankings, we are really not where we want to be. Although 42 isn't 50, we believe we can do better than the bottom 10. In fact, we happen to believe Tennessee belongs in the top 10 in more than just women's basketball. Although we've had some drifting upwards, we believe that a rise in our rightful place in the rankings requires the committed engagement of communities like ours across the state in order to channel our combined energy, resources, and intellect into new solutions that will accelerate our forward movement on serious and significant public health issues and challenges like tobacco use, obesity, and physical inactivity. So what's the solution to our health challenges in Tennessee? We do know that health care doesn't equal health. Although access to health care is important, we don't believe even high quality health care is the silver bullet that will transform the personal choices that keep us mired in the bottom of the rankings. Our commissioner refers to them as the big three, tobacco use, obesity, and physical inactivity. These three problems drive six of the 10 leading cause, causes of death in our state and account for a huge portion of our nation's health care spending. And although access to quality health care is important, we believe accelerating our state's rise to the healthiest top 10 requires significant personal choice change in order to swing the pendulum of habit and preference towards health and wellness. We want to make it easy to succeed in making a choice for health and hard to take the path to health complications. We want to figure out ways to incentivize our communities to do the right thing, to make the choice for wellness. This slide depicts the leading causes of death in our state. It also emphasizes the strong evidence we have that links tobacco use, obesity, and physical inactivity to these leading causes of poor health and years of lost life for our family members, neighbors, and friends. When we look at the determinants of health that are influenced by tobacco use, obesity, and physical inactivity, again, we're stricken by the power these behaviors wield on our health. The next few slides will show you where our east region counties rank when compared to each other, and then compared to the other 79 counties in the state. And uh, the East Region is comprised of the 15 counties that surround Knox. Actually, these slides uh, include Knox in the rankings as well, but they're not a part of the East Region. As we raise the power of our microscope's objective on the East Region's ranking on tobacco use, there's good and bad news, depending on where you live. And with this slide, as with Kermit the Frog, it's good to be green. You can tell I have a five-year-old. So as a region, we're consistently above the state's average rate of smokers at 27 to 31%. But looking on the bright side, that gives us more opportunity for improvement, right? Here we see our region's counties ranked in adult obesity. Again, relatively speaking, green is good. And compared to the rest of the state, well, we're above the state's average and well above the Healthy People 2010 goal of 15%. Hmm, this is getting a little painful, isn't it? Here we are, ranked by physical inactivity. In addition to using the health rankings, the Tennessee Department of Health has published two reports specifically designed to assist local communities in identifying health trends and in navigating a path to improvement. 
Understanding County Health Trends is a document that takes a county by county look at which trends are improving and which aren't. And Drive Your County to the Top 10 calculates what your county needs to do for each health measure included in the health rankings in order to be a top 10 county. These reports are available on our website and we encourage you to use them in your planning efforts. At the end of the day, we are responsible for the road we choose, the choices we model for our children and the choice legacy they inherit. It's time for us to choose differently, to choose wellness, to usher in a new culture, one that rewards healthy behavior and contributes to making our Tennessee one of the healthiest places to live, learn, work, play, and raise our families. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, Dr. Martha Buchan with the Knox County Health Department, and I'm just excited not to be talking about Ebola. <laughs> and I'm not sure if this is a Baptist crowd or you just don't want to walk back up the stairs, but everybody's way up there. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk more specifically about the health here in Knox County. Um, and uh, another, another news about health in Tennessee is, is uh, not um, always good. Frequently it's not. Uh, Knox County, for lots of different reasons, and I might touch on some of those, is a little bit healthier than the counties that surround us. And I'll talk about some of that, uh, what influences that or what we believe influences that. Oops, wrong way. All right, so we talked a little bit about how we rank as a country, how Tennessee ranks, and then how Knox County ranks. So that 37 is out of, about, of, out of 95 developed countries that the World Health Organization ranks. And that's in spite of spending more than twice the next country on health. Can I say that again? More than twice. It's amazing, isn't it? That's our health outcome. Tennessee ranks 42nd, that, like you've heard, and we don't like that either. And then Knox County, we don't rank so bad. We rank 15th out of 95 counties, but we, we've been better. I'm not happy to see that, the direction that we're trending. So if we look at the trends here in Knox County, they haven't changed all that much over the last few years. This is from our behavior risk factor survey. You heard Mr. Johnson refer to that. Um, people reporting poor or fair health hasn't really climbed a lot. People smoking has gone down, but I would not consider that a significant trend um, based just because it's such a small number. And adult obesity in Knox County, at least, has stayed relatively flat. But I will tell you that um, when you talk to the schools, what they see is really amazing. We're seeing type 2 diabetes in our middle school children. Children's Hospital can attest to that as well. I can remember one of the nursing directors at the schools telling me she used to know all the diabetic kids by name in the schools, and now there's so many new ones every year, she can't keep up with them. And those are type 2 diabetics. Those aren't kids with type 1 diabetes. That's not juvenile onset diabetes. That's adult onset diabetes. Um, it's a big, big issue. So let's talk about obesity. Let's talk about obesity in Knox County specifically and about obesity related to income. I could show this slide about obesity related to education as well. So what we see is not a good trend. We see that in our lowest income members of our community, the rate of obesity is increasing faster than it is for anyone else. And we're gonna talk about a little bit about why we think that is true, but it's certainly an alarming trend. And then if we look at, oh, that was, what is it? did I do something? Okay. Hold on, sorry. Yep, okay. Um, so this is obesity by income, sorry. I, I thought, okay, we'll talk about this. Um, <laughs> again, we see that in the lowest, the, the least uh, wealthy in our community, um, we see higher rates of obesity uh, than we do in other parts of our community. I'm doing something wrong. There we go, this is what I thought I was going to. All right, so now let's talk about diabetes. One of the chronic diseases that's a re direct result of obesity, we know that. We could show this slide about hypertension, about heart disease. Again, what we see is that the rate of diabetes in our poorest citizens 
is climbing at a very fast rate and actually really much higher than anyone else. And if you look at the folks who make greater than 50 k, kind of remaining steady there. So what we see is that disparity gap getting larger, and we see this nationally as well, where people who have a higher income, their health is staying about the same, but people who have a lower income, their health is getting worse. So that, again, that gap um, in health. And if we could break this down again by education, we could also break this down by race. Um, it looks similar, not exactly the same, but it looks similar. So if we talk about leisure activity, when we talk, talk about leisure activity, it's activity outside work. It's not the activity you have at work. It's time to go for a walk with your kids or take a run if you're so inclined or go to the gym or whatever. And again, what we see is that in those folks making less than $15,000 a year, their time for leisure activity is, is decreasing. More of them say they have no time. And if you look at the folks on the other end, more of them do have time. So more of them are saying they do get physical activity. So again, we have this disparity. So wh why might that be? There are lots of re things co that contribute to the ability to get physical activity. Is your neighborhood safe? Can you go walk? Do you have time to walk? Maybe, you know, you're, you're only making $15,000 a year and you gotta put food on the table for your kids, gotta get your kids to school and back and all the other things you have to do. Is there margin in their life? to have time to go for a walk. Perhaps they're working more than one job. Um, lots of other reasons for that. It's not because they're lazy, but there's the environment in which we live and the capacity to do that. On $15,000 a year, certainly can't afford a gym membership. You're doing well to, to afford to put food on the table for your children. So let's talk about um, access to food. When we talk about obesity and diabetes, you know, it is, it is behavior driven, yes. What you eat and whether or not you act, are active contribute to whether you're obese or whether you have diabetes. But if you're making less than $15,000 a year, the stress around getting nutritious food on the table for your family or just for yourself is tremendous. And if you go into the grocery store and you look and see, you know, banquet hungry man dinners, you know, five for $5 versus a head of broccoli, What's going to feed your family more? Hungry man dinners, unfortunately. So you're going to choose the thing that makes the most sense for your family. And it's, again, it's not because people are saying, hey, I'd like to be overweight and I would like to be at risk for diabetes. It's that their choices are limited and we have to do something different to enable them to have better choices. And again, this is a study that was done. This is kind of old data, but it probably doesn't look much different when we look at the cost of food um, in our uh, community. So Southwest County is our uh, most affluent section of our community. And the centra central city is one of the least affluent places in our community. And what we see is there's a difference between what their groceries cost. There are many things that contribute to this, many things. One, one of which is there aren't a lot of grocery stores. Um, so if people maybe are getting their food from a convenience store which we all know doesn't, they, they charge more for food and they also don't have a lot of healthy choices. Um, so they're, they're getting their food from non-traditional grocery stores or non-traditional food sources. So that's part of it. But again, when you're, when you're struggling to make ends meet, pay your rent, do all those other things you gotta do um, and put food on the table, it makes no sense that you have to pay more for your food than those of us who don't struggle to do those things. So, before we uh, just blame totally this all on behavior, we also see higher rates of asthma in folks who have a lower income. So we see higher rates of all chronic illness in those who have a lower income. And um, smoking certainly can aggravate asthma and contribute to having more asthma attacks, but causing the disease is really not related to smoking. It's really more related to um, just your, your, partly your environment and things you're exposed to, but also just the predisposition. So we have folks who are making less money, struggling to put food on the table, and having more chronic disease than the rest of us. And we need to do something different. Obviously, telling them to eat less and exercise more is really not a reasonable option, since it's really not a reasonable option in their life to be able to do those things. 
So when we talk about what contributes to health, certainly environment, behavior, social, and genetics do contribute to health. But the other thing we see in these folks, um, in the jobs that they may have, they probably don't have health insurance or even sick days. And so there's a whole other problem. So how much can you keep that job if you can't control your diabetes and you miss work all the time because you're sick and you don't, may not have access to health care? So access is a piece of this. And how we solve that, I'm not sure. But it is, and it's, it's, health is so complicated and lack of health is complicated. And we all in this room and in this community have to do something to make a difference or we're gonna keep these trends going in the same direction, which is not what we wanna do. So thank you. Um, there's our mission, every person a healthy person. No, that's our vision, vision. So uh, anybody have questions of me or Dr. Sturdivant? What we would like to do in this, uh, in this next section, you, you heard, uh, You've heard sort of how this, uh, how the issues are framed. Now we'd like to, uh, to talk uh, a little more specifically about what some of the risks are to Tennessee uh, if uh, these kind of conditions continue and what might happen if, uh, if we're able to, uh, to turn this boat around a little bit. We've asked uh, a group of folks to join us here to talk about that and I'll introduce them uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll kind of go in order here about about what we're going to talk about. We're very pleased to have Dr. Edward Caparelli, who's a physician from Oneida, who's uh, worked in rural areas uh, through most of his career in practice. And uh, we're pleased that Dr. Caparelli could join us. Uh, Rhonda Rice, who's executive vice president of the Knoxville Chamber and probably one of the chief uh, economic and business recruiters in this, in this area to talk about the uh, economic impact. Dr. Matt Murray from the University of Tennessee Center for Business and Economic Research and, uh, and the Howard Baker Center to talk about generally about health policy and, and the economic impact. And then Mr. Tom Ferrier, who's the CEO of Bush Brothers, one of the major employers uh, in Knoxville and in, in truly in East Tennessee. So what we ask is uh, each one of the members of the panel to, uh, to make a few comments about uh, uh, their perspective on the risk to Tennessee of the unhealthy behaviors and unhealthy uh, statistics that we've heard about, and then uh, we'll certainly uh, open it up for, uh, for questions and answers. And uh, we hope that you'll jot some of those down and, uh, and ask them. I expect that uh, they probably wouldn't mind if you interrupted as we went along, but if you'll save your questions, we'll have a discussion after all of our uh, panel members have had an opportunity to make their comments. So, Dr. Caprelli, I'll invite you to go first, sir, please. Uh, I'm Ed Caparelli and I'm a family physician. I work in uh, Oneida in Scott County. Uh, I'd like to uh, give a patient presentation, uh, I think which talks a lot to the problems that we face. Uh, this is a patient that I currently take care of. Uh, Danny is a 57-year-old white male who I first saw in my office a little over three years ago. He had been seen in the emergency room for weakness and was found to be hypertensive. He had not seen a doctor for several years prior to that visit because he couldn't afford it. In the emergency room, he was told to find a primary care provider, and he came to see us because we offered sliding fee based on income. In his younger years, he'd worked as a carpenter with his father. After his father's death, he did several jobs, including apartment maintenance and rental company delivery man. More recently, he's just done odd jobs around town for cash. He's applied for TenCare several times, and he's been turned down each time because he had no proof of income. On history, uh, he'd basically been healthy with no previous hospitalizations, but he did have a 50-pack year history of smoking. His blood pressure was very high in our office, and lab work showed him to be hypothyroid. He was treated with lisinopril and levothyroxine, which he got from the Walmart $4 plan. We counseled him about smoking, but he could not afford the patches or other medications to help him quit. He'd previously been told he had sleep apnea, but he couldn't afford a sleep study, nor could he afford the CPAP machine that he needed to treat that. He had a heart rate in the mid 40s, which persisted even after I corrected his hypothyroidism, but he couldn't afford the $300 that the cardiologist wanted for an initial consultation. His heart rate gradually worsened to the high 30s, but he continued to refuse cardiology referral because he couldn't afford it. 
He's been hospitalized twice in the last six months with chest pains. After the initial workup, the hospital cardiologist told him that he might need a pacemaker, but he needed to get insurance first. What can we see from this? First off, why did he go to the emergency room? The emergency room is probably the most expensive place to get primary care, but for the poor and the uninsured, it's also the cheapest place. Uh, the charges are far higher than they would be in my office, but the emergency room doesn't demand money up front. Uh, the emergency room doesn't tell you you have to wait two weeks for an appointment. You walk in and you're seen, even though you might have to wait a few hours to do that. Um, they get testing and treatment, and then they get a huge bill, which they don't pay. So it becomes the cheapest way to get health care. But what does that actually mean to the health care system? I work in Scott County. Scott County is about 60 miles north of Knoxville, uh, right on the uh, Kentucky border. It has 533 square miles and 22,000 inhabitants. That's about 40 people per square mile. In recent years, several factories in Scott County have closed down, causing Scott County to have the highest unemployment rate in Tennessee for the last five years. It's never been in the single digits. It's currently at 13.9% compared to the state average of 7.4%. Many of these uninsured have gone to the hospital emergency room for primary care. Some have been hospitalized and incurred even larger debts. An increasing amount of uncollectible bills from these patients led to our hospital closing down in May of 2012. It has reopened last December, but it greatly reduced services uh, and without either obstetrics or surgery. The previous hospital had been one of the largest employers in the county. When it closed down, a lot of the small family businesses also closed down. Uh, so there were spin-off consequences, and all of this really stems from the high percentage uh, of, of people in Scott County who are both uh, unemployed and also who lack insurance. Why did he come to see us then? I mentioned that we offer sliding fee. Uh, I'm medical director for Mountain People's Health Council, which is uh, a group of five clinics uh, spread throughout uh, Scott County, but it, it's also, they're also federally qualified health centers. Uh, that means that we get some uh, money from the federal government to provide health care to people that don't have health insurance. Uh, we work through the Tennessee Primary Care Association, and if, if you look at their numbers, there are 32 other organizations very similar to ours across the state, having 310 providers uh, in 207 sites located in 77 of the 95 counties in Tennessee. We do get some federal funds that enable us to provide primary health care services to individuals without health insurance. In 2013, we saw 11,000 patients, uh, 33,000 patient encounters. Of those 33,000 encounters, 7,500 of them were to patients that had no health insurance. Based on their income, we can slide their visits down to $10, and that $10 includes any x-rays taken in our site and any lab tests that we draw on our site and send out. That's really pretty cheap. Um, when you look at what that means, that means in 2013, for those 7,500 patients, we provided over $1.3 million of care. If you slide this over to the other Tennessee Primary Care Association sites, just extrapolating, in that same time frame, they saw 400,000 patients, 900,000 visits, and I estimate roughly $40 million in services across the state of Tennessee the people that are uninsured. So the, the federally qualified health centers do help. They are a part of the solution. Now, why couldn't I get Danny to go to see the specialist? Well, guess what? If you go to see a specialist, they want money up front. In fact, the specialists that we tried, we've, we've contacted want anywhere from two to $300 cash to walk through the door, first visit. Hospitals, if you need to have an MRI, if you need to have stress testing, they all want money up front as well, $200, $500, $800, and then you work out a payment plan to pay off the rest. So anything that's non-emergent is really difficult for people that don't have health insurance. Um, and, you know, this cost also means that these people without health insurance don't get the needed preventive services that are recommended. They don't get mammograms. They don't get colonoscopies. So what happens? We identify their breast cancer, their colon cancer, their lung cancer, when it's quite far along in the disease process and costs a whole lot more to treat. 
Um, in addition, in a rural area, specialists aren't there. They're not going to go up to a county that has a, a very high unemployment rate. So if the nearest doctor is 70 miles away and these people don't have transportation, that's another imp impediment to rural counties getting access to health care. Well, how about medicines? Walmart's done a great job with their $4 medicine list. Uh, it's probably been the biggest boon to access to medications that's happened in the last 20 years. But with some of the new changes in, in uh, uh, rebates from pharmaceutical companies to Medicaid, the amount of samples that are available in my office to give to patients has dried up significantly in the past 10 years. The indigent care plans uh, are way down. The rebates are for people that have commercial insurance. A $50 rebate to cover your $50 copay, but they don't offer the $200 rebate to cover your full cost of your medication. Um, so if I can't care for them with a $4 list, I'm in trouble. The new medications have gone up significantly in the last seven years, 10 years. 10 years ago, a new medicine may cost $100 to $150. Now a, a newer branded medication probably is in the $250 to $350 a month range per medication. So, you know, this, is, this makes that little difficult. Uh, as an FQHC site, we do have access to, to some funding through a, a federal 340B program. However, that may cut the cost of medicines roughly 50% for branded medicines. 50% off $300 still comes out to $150 for one medication for one month. So that becomes a real problem as well. Well, how about the Affordable Care Act? That's really solved the problem, hasn't it? <laughs> Not. Uh, if you look at the Affordable Care Act, the, the, the federal government says 7 million people have gotten health care. They don't talk about the people that used to work full-time, but now their hours have been cut, so they're not full-time employees, so they don't have to, their employer doesn't have to offer them health care. So the fellow that works at Cracker Barrel or at McDonald's is down to working 20 hours a week and trying to work three jobs to make ends meet. People that had health insurance on a, a restricted plan can't have that plan anymore because that plan's been done away with. It didn't offer obstetrical services to the 60-year-old male. I don't quite know why a 60-year-old male needs obstetrical services, but apparently everyone has to have access to that. So there are a lot of people that have lost insurance. Um, and then the people that got were able to get it. Some people tried to apply. If they don't make enough money, you don't make enough money to pay the, for, the, for the, the rebate program to work in Affordable Care Act. And the ones that did get it opted for the cheapest program. That means they have a limited network. So the people in Scott County, the only doctors they can see are in South Knoxville. That doesn't really help a whole lot. They also found out that when they tried to go to get their MRI, that their $10,000 deductible had to be paid up front. So again, these people supposedly have health insurance, but they really don't have access. Um, so kind of in conclusion, when you look across the board, um, lack of health insurance, lack of health care in rural areas has struck increasingly hard, uh, been an increasingly major problem. Access to primary care through the Tennessee Primary Care Association and the federally qualified health centers does help. But access to specialty care, access to testing, uh, access to any medications that are not available for $4 really does cause a major problem for people in rural areas to get health care. Uh, the large number of uninsured has caused a, a cash flow deficit that led to at least the Scott County Hospital closing and several other hospitals in rural counties becoming uh, at risk of closing. And Affordable Care Act didn't really solve the problem. So anyway, I'm, uh, unfortunately, my, my presentation doesn't give a whole lot of hope, but it does point out that there are significant problems in rural areas. Thank you. Way. There's an awful lot of the issues that Dr. Kelly <coughs> talked about 
that, that end up here in, in our, in, because Knoxville is a referral area, we are, uh, all have a regional referral networks, that those, those issues end up, uh, end up being a big part of the, uh, the issues for our medical center to deal with. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to ask Robin, if you will see next, and talk a little bit about the chamber and from the economic uh, impact on the group. Thank you, John. Good morning. Uh, as, as John mentioned, one of the things that the Knoxville Chamber uh, does is assist companies, whether they are small startup companies or uh, here, in, here in our region looking to grow, or expanding companies who are also looking to grow, and then recruiting companies into our area. That can be a variety of different types of companies, whether it's a manufacturing corporation or uh, a corporate uh, entity that's looking to relocate. And there are a number of site selection criteria that come into play when companies are looking at, at, at those choices. It's a very competitive industry, it's a very competitive world out there when you're looking to grow jobs and grow the economy. And we are very fortunate uh, here, not only in, in you know the Knoxville region, but in Tennessee as well, that we have a lot of assets that are very attractive to companies that are looking to grow. And I know some of the rankings earlier, you know, are not some places that we necessarily want to be, but we do have some positive rankings in that the state of Tennessee is one of the top uh, number one sites for companies looking to relocate. So we are on the radar list and we have to make sure that we do things that keep Tennessee in that, uh, in that view. Also, Knoxville is fortunate that we continue to rank consistently in, in top 10 rankings, whether it's in livability or business growth or opportunities. And so what we want to do is, is take a look at that criteria and see what we can do to consistently improve our chances for growing jobs. In a, uh, in a recent survey conducted by Area Development Magazine, they surveyed more than 200 different site selection consultants who work with these type of projects to see what are the factors in the decision making process. Some of these are very typical that you, you would not be surprised at all to find that, um, that real estate and location is, is one of the top five. Also your infrastructure, your needs uh, for companies, as well as your taxes incentives. And then the last two have to do with labor and workforce and quality of life. And I left those two together at the end because more and more of what we are seeing today is that a workforce ready, skilled community has to do with your quality of life more and more than it has before. Companies are looking at employees who are able to come to work, they are healthy, as, as indicated earlier, they need to be able to come to do their jobs. It's all about the cost of doing business. And if a company has to continue to spend resources on consistent rehiring because someone doesn't show up for work because of health issues, if they have to consistently spend money to retrain, all of these things are going to impact their bottom line. And that type of information is going to make us less attractive to companies who want to grow. And so it gets right down basically um, to, uh, to a, a bottom line business decision. And one of the things that we have seen in companies who, who do look at our area is their workforce is much more focused on a healthy lifestyle than perhaps it had been in the past. You have a younger workforce, you have people who are interested in recreational opportunities. And we have, again, several things here in, in our region that offer those, um, such as you know the urban wilderness bike paths, Companies are asking the questions, but they do want to know what extends out into the rural communities and opportunities because we do have a mobile workforce in our region that, that does look for opportunity. So as companies begin to focus on those costs, it's important that we as a community make sure that the education and the workforce and that, that training to, to be a healthy employee is something that we continue to strive and, and to make sure that we are producing the quality needed here in our region. We'll, uh, we'll stay on the, on the economic topic uh, for the time being, and I'll uh, ask Dr. Matt Murray if he will uh, continue this conversation. 
Thank you, John, and thank you for the invitation to participate in the forum this morning. A uh, very critical issue for the state of Tennessee, for quality of life, and for our path of economic development going forward. I'd like to think about health status from three different perspectives. It's all the same issue, but uh, three different perspectives. One would be the perspective of an individual household and an individual worker. And there is abundant evidence that poor health status compromises one's productivity. Uh, poor health status can limit one's ability to participate in the labor market. If you are able to participate in the labor market as somebody that is suffering from uh, some particular health problem, uh, there's a very good chance that your productivity on the job has been reduced. Uh, that means potentially lost earnings. You put your job at risk. You put your household finances at risk. So there are very, very serious consequences for the individual worker that spill over to the family around that individual worker. And health status is, is one of the factors that can uh, compromise the finances of a family, can cause an individual to lose a home, um, potentially even lose a family. A uh, complementary perspective on health status would be to look at the situation from that of an employer. Um, employers need workers who show up every day on time, who are productive uh, throughout the day, throughout the week, workers who are reliable. Uh, the reason is these businesses have to compete, particularly for businesses they're competing with uh, their counterparts around the country, around the world, where you have to produce a product, sell it nationally, sell it globally, you have got to have a very productive workforce. So if you have workers who have low health status, if you have workers that incur significant health care costs, and you, the employer, have to bear part of the burden of that, it makes it more difficult than otherwise would be the case for you to compete in the marketplace. And we heard earlier today about the poor health status of the Tennessee population. Uh, the numbers are, uh, unfortunately, rich and abundant, and that would suggest that everything else the same, employers in Tennessee, uh, firms that have a national and international present, presence are going to confront more disadvantageous costs here than they might otherwise encounter elsewhere. The good news is what Rhonda Rice just described. We have a lot of other attributes within this local region within Tennessee that make us attractive and allow businesses to continue to come here and compete. But those high health care cost burdens represent a significant factor to make them less competitive in the marketplace. So then last, let's look at this from the perspective of society at large. Um, this is part of it uh, where it's very difficult for me as, a, as an individual member of society and as an economist um, to not get a little irritated at the debate about health care, health care reform, health care insurance. Uh, there are dramatic costs to society, some of which were outlined this morning uh, in the earlier remarks, dramatic costs to society associated with poor health status. Whether it's from behavior, whether it's from environmental factors, whatever the source, uh, we as a society at large are bearing dramatic costs, uh, the costs associated with smoking. Uh, alcohol, drug abuse, um, those, are, those are staggering costs, and we all are paying those costs. The individuals that were described earlier, the individual that was described earlier relying on emergency room care because that individual did not have health care insurance, who do you think is paying the cost of that individual going to the emergency room? It's us. It's primarily those of us in this room who are paying it through cross-subsidization through our insurance program, through higher taxes, and fees and so on. We are paying the costs and we are losing a great deal. Now, you, now these problems we're talking about this morning are, are deeply embedded in society. Um, uh, I, was, I, I went to my doctor several months ago and I was asked to do the following. I was asked to double my water intake and to eat about six ounces of nuts a day. I thought, what could be easier? I cannot tell you how hard it was to double <laughs> my water intake and I still can't eat six ounces of nuts a day. I figured out what the trick with the nuts is, is you eat those and you go to lunch and you're not hungry. And so what I've decided is, is I'd rather have lunch. Um, <laughs> so I, I use a silly personal example. It's true, but if, if it's difficult for me to double water intake and eat four to six ounces of nuts a day, Think about the consequences for individuals who don't have the opportunity, who don't have the willpower, who don't have the wherewithal to make the right choice. 
So there are no easy solutions to this problem, but I be, believe very, very strongly um, as an individual and as an economist who studies what government does, that we need to have universal health care in this country. We can quibble about how we do it and how we fund it, and all of that quibbling has compromised our move to what is absolutely necessary to society, and that is universal health care insurance. Uh, we have got to have everybody in the system. We are paying the price for those people not being in the system right now. We're paying it, as I noted earlier, through our taxes, through our own health insurance programs, and then we as a society at large are bearing the cost of alcohol abuse, of smoking, and so on. We are all bearing those costs. And I'm not suggesting to you that universal health insurance will solve all of those problems, that it will certainly help mitigate the problems, and it will help educate individuals, patients, about better health care. And I also have to note, particularly given some of the charts that were shown earlier, um, there's a very, strong, a very strong education element to lifestyle choices, to access to health care, and so on. And when I looked at some of those maps that described obesity and so on, what I see in those charts is low levels of educational attainment where those health problems are high, and high levels of educational attainment where those health behaviors and health outcomes are low. So we as a state spend relatively little compared to uh, other states around the country on education. We have improved dramatically. Uh, Governor Haslam has taken some significant strides forward, drive to 55 being one of those. We have made really significant improvements in educational investment and we are improving in our educational attainment. But we have a long way to go. Insurance, Better education, I think, are two of the broad things that we can do to promote health status, promote a better workforce, and promote a stronger economy. It will not come without a price, but I would argue that we already are paying a very dear price for the poor health status of Tennesseans. Thank you. Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody. Um, sitting here looking at the seating pattern in the room reminds me of my, my grandmother, who was an Irish immigrant. Uh, in her, her Irish brogue, she used to say, oh, I know I'm in America because everybody wants to be in the front of the line, the back of the church, in the middle of the road. So. <laughs> <laughs> but good morning. You know, I, uh, I'm going to deviate a little bit from the setup John had. I think the, the issues are quite apparent throughout the morning here. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deviate a little bit and talk a little bit about the, the background status, if you will, of business and how it's looking and viewing and, and addressing this problem. Some of the impact that I've seen in, in, this, in the studies and in the research, and then maybe talk a little bit about uh, our role as business as we go through this. Uh, I do sit here as, you know, as a business voice on the panel. It would be a little arrogant of me to think that I'm representing all business because the fact of the matter is uh, there are a number of different ways uh, that businesses are addressing this issue. And I think some of that just becomes uh, natural because we are different businesses. An insurance company is going to act very different than a manufacturing facility. Uh, and its costs and cost structures are going to be very different. So we might find different models as we go through this. But I do think one, uh, one thing that we are aligned on is what we need out of our workforce, right? And I don't just say that as, as an employer, as a person who's hiring people. I think if you sitting here think about what you need as a peer working next to you, there are some things that we all fundamentally need to go about to go about our roles, right? Uh, intellectually, we need people who are, uh, who are educated to a competent and competitive level, who can understand the complexities of business and the workplace today, not to mention the technology that exists in, in a lot of businesses. Um, we need, psychologically, people that are stable, that are, that are not under the influence of, of drugs or alcohol, that have uh, depression and those kind of conditions under control. Uh, we need people that are growth oriented, and I mean personal growth orientation, uh, who are willing to develop and develop new skills and contribute 
and serve our organizations or our businesses, our companies, or our brands uh, in a way that's consistent with the mission and the purpose that we've all outlined. And so there's a psychological aspect to this, and then certainly physically. Uh, we need people who, who can come to work and are fit for their role, right? Uh, who, who can sustain that effort throughout a work day, throughout a work week, throughout a work year or a career, right? And so there's this notion of sort of occupational fitness or, or sort of like an occupational athlete. There's a certain amount of conditioning that we all need to do to be able to, to sustain and, and contribute to, to our jobs. Today, we're probably focused on that third one quite a bit, but it, my opinion is that those are certainly interrelated uh, and, and can uh, affect each other. Um, but I would tell you as background, I. Remember 1987, that was the first year that I had a health risk appraisal, so a blood count and a blood draw at work. Uh, so business has been at this for a long time, and there were certainly some leading businesses and, and others to follow. Um, but I know in my 12 years here or so in Tennessee, I have been exposed not only at my company, but to a lot of other companies in the way uh, we are addressing this issue. Um, and we're doing it with the intention, or at least we started with the intention, that we could make it cheaper and make people healthier. Um, there have been a number of strategies employed for different reasons, right? There have been cost-shifting strategies where companies or businesses took costs from the employer and shifted them to the employee uh, with the intention or the purpose of thinking that it's, it's about consumerism that if employees have a bigger stake in the game through premiums or higher deductibles, that they would take charge of their, uh, their own expenditures and choices, right? There are other models where we have incented people, you know, $100 to, to attend a smoking secession program or something, those, along those lines. There have been education and empowerment uh, models where we uh, give people their, their metrics, their personal metrics, uh, through blood uh, screenings and, and, and blood draws and those kind of things with the intention that uh, if we give them that education, give them uh, that information that they will change their behavior, sort of a if you know better, you'll do better kind of a strategy. And then, of course, there's the mix of those going on, some incentives mixed with some other uh, kind of carrot stick kind of things as well as education empowerment. So there are all, all these models going on, uh, and, and a lot of people have been doing this with the hopes that a variety of business metrics would improve. So healthcare costs, for one, obviously, but then the costs of things like absenteeism or improved productivity or improved quality and those kind of things. My take is that for some, that has worked. For others, not so much. So we've got this sort of mix going on of what's successful and what's not. I think part of that, as I said before, has to do with just the nature of your business or what the baseline is, so to speak. You may have old, an older work group when you start these programs or a younger one. So there are a lot of very complicating factors um, and, and many of them have different weights in this. Nonetheless, what we found is that trying to correlate much draw cause and effect uh, to our emphasis or our priority put on health and, and health and wellness is difficult to track to cost. But still, you know, the fact remains. Three quarters of uh, our U.S. healthcare costs, according to the Centers for uh, uh, Disease Control, come from chronic condition, conditions such as <coughs> obesity and diabetes, right? So we heard the numbers this morning, how big the, the issue is, right? The RAND Corporation was commissioned to conduct an analysis of workplace health and wellness programs which concluded just this last year. It was the largest study of its kind to date. I'm sure we will have more because of rooms like this. But it cited several things. It cited the fact that 50% of all organizations with 50 or more employees had some kind of a health and wellness program of, of one of those strategies that I just talked about. They also cited that these plans, that these, these programs that are being undertaken, drive annual health screenings, counseling, education, and preparation of education materials that are provided by third-party providers other than the business you're in that's, that's aggregate to be an industry of $6 billion. So on top of the, the cost that we've all talked about today, 
there's, an, there's yet another cost coming in uh, that businesses are incurring to, to help prevent, to educate employees and enable and empower them. And the Rand Cor Corporation concluded, and, and I'll quote this, we find solid evidence that appropriate programs can meaningfully improve some health-related behaviors. In particular, they named exercise frequency, smoking secession, and short-term weight control. Notice those are all kind of behaviors. Don't, those aren't necessarily the metrics that some of us went into trying to lower like cholesterol or blood pressure or glucose, right? But it does strong, tie a strong correlation to those behaviors. And of course, you might ask, with all this going on, well, the other thing they said is it's not clear at this point whether improved health-related behavior will translate into lower cost or use activities such as emergency departments and hospital care. So, you know, you sit there and you, you, you see these studies, you hear these results, and you ask yourself, so why were the prize so big? And with so many of us working on it and so much money going against the, pre the, the prevention, why isn't it clearer, right? Um, and I think there are some reasons. I, I think um, one may be in the sort of the nature of the way healthcare costs are spent in our lifetimes, right? Think of a U-shaped curve. If you plot age along an x-axis and dollars along a, a vertical y, you get this sort of U-shape. We've done this in our company. There's no question that we're spending more dollars in the first six months of life and the last six months of life than we do in between. And so if we look at this in a, in a sort of a micro sense, business is kind of operating in that lowest part of the curve. We're hiring people at 18, 20 years old and they're exiting the workforce at 60 or 65, but they're living now 15 or 20 years longer than that. And so, you know, it, it becomes a question of um, what do we do with that? You know, what's our role in that as a business? We've added this $6 billion industry and, and our hope is, I think, one of the reasons we're in this is I, I believe we think that we will eventually change the shape of that curve, that that tail end will be, begin to drop if we can prevent things because of these behaviors uh, that we in fact are, uh, and we, we in fact, uh, the studies show, and I think you know, the data this morning shows, these are kind of our biggest problems, right? The, the, the whole thing of, of movement and smoking secession and, and those kind of things. So it's getting at these behaviors, I think, is really, really important. Some people might ask, well, if, if business is operating in sort of the belly of this curve, why are we doing it, right? Because people think, well, you're, you're all just about profit. And I, I think that is one of the myths of business, right? That it's all about profit. I think what we see, or what we feel in a, in a large part, many of us, that we actually have something to contribute to society in this way. We care about our employees, and we feel some responsibility to make them healthier. So we are not all just about shareholder value. Uh, we think of it in terms of stakeholders and that we can affect this. And when you, when you think about 110 million households in the United States, you can debate the precision of the unemployment number, but just about every household has somebody earning money. So right out of the blocks, business can impact a huge number of Americans. And I think it's a model, or I believe that it's a model where we just haven't been at it long enough. We need to see these efforts, we need to see these behavior modifications manifest themselves uh, in better health, but it's going to take a while. Uh, I liken it to the way we would think of a new product in the marketplace. Uh, as a food company, or many of you maybe in other manufacturing companies think, but the first thing a marketer will tell you is you need awareness. You know, you need people to see it. You need people to be aware it's there. And then you get trial. And once you get trial, you have something that works, you get repeat. And I think we are very much in that early part of this thing, even though we've been at it a while. Um, I think we really need to focus on awareness and trying to enable people and educate people so that those three things to me are the trifecta, awareness, educate, and enable 
um, that we will have a flywheel effect, that this thing will uh, continue to grow and continue to affect behaviors, and I believe those behaviors will eventually affect the metrics that we all measure in our screenings. So, thank you. questions that I'm going to pose to the panel while you all are thinking about your, your questions or anything that you'd like to address to the, the folks that are on here. And I don't know whether uh, this would be to, uh, to Rhonda or, or to Matt, but um, are there, do you, maybe to Rhonda, we'll start there. Uh, will the businesses and the, the industries that you're talking to or the ones you, that you cross paths with, will they be willing to accept short-term interim strategies for improving health of the, of the workforce that they're working for? Or do we as a, as a community and as a state have to have some a demonstrated track record that we really have turned the boat around and that uh, health, the health of the citizens in this state's improving? Uh, do we have a chance in the interim or do we really have to put a stake in the ground and have some results before it's going to impact uh, the work that you do every day? <coughs> Thank you, John. Um, I, I think we do have a chance. I think um, several of the things that we see when, when companies are considering uh, our region here in this area is they ask other employers. You know, they may go and visit with Tom and ask them about what policies or what procedures that they are doing to help with their workforce. And so when they look at models and examples to see what the existing companies in our region are doing, that does give us a chance. I think the other thing is the fact that, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, you know, Governor Haslam is certainly looking at the state of Tennessee as a whole in ways that we need to address health care. And as long as you have both of those things, uh, examples of companies and the citizenry looking at be, being a healthy community, um, then, then I think that, you know, that does come into play and, and gives us an opportunity. I think the third thing is um, education is key. And, and, it, and it, you know, we're looking at generational changes here, and I think it's really, it has to begin uh, with healthy choices in our schools. It has to begin with, you know, recreational opportunities and exercise, and you continue that lifestyle, and so that when they become a part of the workforce, it is, it is a common uh, practice and lifestyle that they are accustomed to. Um, question that of the things that, that you've tried and that you know that your colleagues have tried in terms of incentives, um, are, there, are there some that, that seem to be the most effective or that you think might have the most impact that we need to focus on? We've, you know, we've tried the, the, uh, the things with you know, reduced premiums if you live with this or if you have the screenings and those things. And your experience or your colleagues, are there things that seem to be more effective than others? Or Well, yeah, I think, again, that is... That's a very customized, personalized to the company kind of question, I think, John. Um, we, uh, in our business, uh, we are pretty capital intensive. It takes a big plant and a lot of equipment to, to make cans of beans, right? Uh, an insurance company or an accounting firm uh, w whose major investment really is the people is going to have some, probably some different models. We have successfully uh, affected smoking secession. Um, we have uh, offered that to people and offered to, to help them, you know, with the cost of that. We have, uh, we have a one incentive, I guess I'd say, uh, in that you can lower your premium by simply participating in the health risk appraisal. So our health risk appraisal is a, a booklet that you answer some questions around behavior, seat belt use, and driving habits, and all kinds of things. But the, the real analytical part is the, the blood draw. Um, that incentive to get people to do that, uh, I believe we're up in the high 90s, if not near 100% participation in that. Um, so armed with that information, we think employees are taking advantage of uh, programs at work or outside of work uh, to, to improve exercise habits, uh, stop smoking, uh, and, um, um, and diet and weight control. And the, the smoking issue is one that's, that's difficult. The medical centers, all of the, the hospitals in Knoxville a couple of years ago made the commitment to be smoke-free campuses. And there's always that, that uh, the, the balance of that because all of us know, and uh, the, I had this 
this encounter with the legislator a couple years ago, uh, it's all well and good that tobacco has been a cash crop uh, in Tennessee and has put a lot of people through school and uh, helped a lot of families uh, over the years because that was the main crop. It's changed now. We've all seen the statistics, but uh, so there are there are things that are pluses and minuses that, that we have to that we have to balance out, and hopefully those those things will those things will uh, will play out over time. Uh, Dr. Murray, are there any sectors of the economy that maybe more immune or insulated or in a better in a better place to deal with health issues, or is it kind of across the board? Well, John, I think, I think it is across the board, but I think what you would find is that companies that are characterized, going back to my, my earlier point, if not sermon, um, I think if you find companies that are characterized by a very well-educated uh, workforce, you're going to find that that workforce in that company doesn't suffer from the problems that you would find for smaller firms that are characterized by using a, a poorly trained and poorly paid workforce. So I think there's a tremendous correlation between income between, and education and health outcomes. And so all companies are at risk. Um, even if you have a, a professional firm of architects or something like that, or a law firm, um, a small firm, and you have one of those individuals, you're in, a, in an insurance pool, one of those individuals has a catastrophic health problem, it can be catastrophic for your health plan. So it really is a problem that affects all of society, all potentially all workers, and all firms, but firms with that better educated workforce are less prone to be subject to the, the onerous costs of high health care. Okay. I'd like to thank the panel for um, coming today. I just want to pre preface my thoughts in that people in the room know me that um, 28 years practice in neonatology in this institution. My uh, wife is a pediatric nurse practitioner, runs Vine Middle School Clinic. My daughter's a pediatric nurse practitioner. My daughter-in-law is a pediatric nurse practitioner. And my son is soon to be a pediatric orthopedist. So we're heavily invested in child health. Um, if you look at worldwide epidemiologic studies now across almost every nation, uh, it has shown that poor pregnancy outcomes, prematurity and low birth weight, leads to the issues that we're talking about. You increase coronary artery disease, you increase stroke, you increase future low birth weight, future prematures, future adult onset diabetes, future um, uh, babies uh, that have obesity. Twelve and a half percent of all babies in the state of Tennessee, one out of eight, are born preterm. Nine percent of babies in the state of Tennessee are born low birth weight. If you look at where dollars might be better spent to change health care outcomes, where we can change health care behaviors, it's been shown that mother, healthy uh, babies lead to healthy, healthy mothers, lead to healthy babies, lead to healthy communities. Mothers and women make health care decisions in communities. Are we spending our dollars in the wrong decade of life? I don't think there's any, uh, there's any question that there, there are many variables. I, I was sitting here earlier as, as some of the folks are commenting and as a person who's never real excited about, the, about an algebra class because there are too many variables in the equation, I think we're seeing today that there are a lot of variables in these equations and maybe we should have paid more attention in algebra to figure out how, how to balance some of these things and make them work. Other questions? <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is Richard Hennigan. I'm a mostly retired uh, family nurse practitioner. Uh, hello to Dr. Sturdivant and Dr. Buchanan from my years with the health department. Um, I, I've been spending my time lately, uh, I still volunteer in, in a faith-based clinic and I know from my years in the health department and in that work that there are thousands, probably tens, hundreds of thousands of, of Tennesseans who fit the picture that uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Capar Caparelli painted of his case of people who are, lack access to care and make poor choices and make the only choices they can. Um, I, I wanted to make a couple of points. I'm, I'm uh, on the board of a small Tennessee nonprofit called the Tennessee Healthcare Campaign. And we, uh, we have been working over the We've been around for 25 years. In the last few years, we've been working especially to try to 
uh, see the Affordable Care Act benefit the state as much as possible. It's certainly not a perfect law and there are problems with it. But there are a couple of things I wanted to point out. Uh, the, the, the population group in Dr. Buchanan's slides, the, uh, the 15,000 and under group, that, that is the group that would most benefit from the state accepting uh, the federal money uh, to cover people that are in the Medicaid group. Now, what language you want to use uh, and how the governor wants to do that, uh, that's less important right now. But we have, the state has lost $800 million, $800 million this year because we have not come forward to accept it. So that's, that's money that would be available to provide uh, services, healthcare services, preventive services to th that particularly that population. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is that uh, I don't know if people noticed the figure, but just this week, uh, the, the, the group at UT that surveys, does a survey to estimate the number of uninsured in the state, uh, found that the, the number of uninsured people in the state of Tennessee went down 25% in the last year. Uh, during since the one year that the Affordable Care Act has been in effect, and there's no doubt that people have made have maybe not made the best choice every time in the insurance they picked, uh, but but it's only been one year, uh, and the Affordable Care Act has a tremendous uh, emphasis on prevention. It has a tremendous uh, concern about these issues that have been raised about behavior. Uh, the whole aspect of the law that has to do with paying for outcomes and not for just uh, numbers uh, is uh, the governor and, and the Affordable Care Act are on the same page about that. We all want to see more effectiveness, but it's hard to see how uh, if Tennesseans don't have access to health care, um, how they're going to get ongoing regular education about how they should carry out their health behaviors uh, in, a, in, a, in an effective way. Uh, so I, I would just encourage the health department and the state uh, to not resist the Affordable Care Act so much as they have been, but to try to make it work as far as it's workable, because it's already had a tremendous effect. I mean, a 25% decrease in the uninsured, now that's not going to affect tomorrow, but hopefully in the next year or two we will see improved health statistics in the state because of that. And hopefully that number will go down another 25% after this current open enrollment's over. Thank you. My name is Mark Cramolini. I work over at the Children's Hospital. We've all gotten very good at drilling down to root causes of issues. And it seems to me when you talk about uh, food abuse, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, tobacco abuse, you're talking about a mental health issue, yet we don't spend the resources we need to to support people. Uh, so I would like to see businesses offer free psychological counseling to their, to their yeah. employees. Now, I think that would actually result in a net gain. Mm -hmm. well, that, that adds one more variable to that long equation. That one in the first place. Um, as being a student, we're taught, you know, a little bit of everything. And one of the things that we have discussed in depth with our class that's soon to graduate is the fact that there is a health department in every county. There are doctors in those health departments in every county. They're federally paid. Why are we not utilizing our health departments for these under 15,000 people? Because as a student, that's me. Um, I have two children as well. I take them to the health department all the time. I can't be seen there though. I'm an adult. But if I get sick, I miss school, they miss school, I miss work, then we're really in trouble. Why are we not utilizing the health departments that are already here? And they're in every county, even if they're rural. They're there. Um, just to answer that, address the issue of why we're using health departments, um, that's where our FQHCs, our partners in healthcare delivery, uh, really step up to the plate 
and provide those that care. We have a FQHC here in Knox County, Cherokee Health. Um, they have sliding scale fee. They take all insurances and different. They see kids and adults both. So really, we made the decision in Knox County to support their efforts, and they see those folks under 15K um, here in Knox County, and we partner with them and uh, make use of that so that the children and adults can get the care they need. Um, I can't really speak to the to the region so much, but Dr. Sturdivant can. We do have four, which haven't been advertised or marketed, but we do have four primary care uh, clinics throughout the region. Um, and basically the only eligibility requirement is that you not have, have health insurance. So, um, and you have to be a legal, you have to be in a legal status here in this country. But, um, and we try to do the best we can. We have a generic formulary and are, you know, I think do a pretty good job of uh, keeping folks that are real motivated out of the ED. Um, and we try to focus on prevention, um, but uh, it's not a panacea. We, we don't do diagnostic, we don't have access to diagnostics or as Dr. Caparelli mentioned, access to specialty care and that's, that's a significant issue. So, um, thank you. Uh, can I go back to this challenge question? Um, no, I mean, we kind of moved on before, I, you know, I could really, uh, I guess, register. I do know, I, I can't tell you how widespread, I can't give you a statistic of number of companies um, or their results, right? but I do know uh, of companies, um, one for sure, that has what we call an employee assistance plan that is anonymously accessible for people that do have uh, any kind of um, concern, I guess you'd say, with uh, any kind of psychological problems, depression, uh, family abuse problems, um, marital problems, all kinds of things like that uh, that employees can access. So. I wouldn't say, I don't know how widespread it is, I wouldn't say though, I wouldn't want to leave the impression that it does not exist. Uh, because I do think employers are looking at, uh, again, not just the physical aspects, but the psychological and the intellectual um, uh, attributes that come to the workforce and that we have to deal with. So. Tom, I'll just echo that. Um, there are, as, and as a matter of fact, it's uh, surprising to us the number of small businesses who also offer employee assistance programs. Uh, and in, it's a huge benefit to what we see. It's also, it is a question, again, that we see companies looking to grow that they will ask our existing companies. So there are a number here in the region who do offer those things, and I think that number is continuing to increase. Get myself in trouble, I think. Um, I think it's a lot to ask for private business to do what you described, and I don't think we can expect most businesses to do it. It would be great if they would, but they have to compete. And uh, you know, Bush Beans, you you have a profit motive. You will have broader uh, goals and objectives with your business, but in the in the end, you've got to make a profit. And companies are not going to unilaterally stand up in this day and age, and by and large, provide very generous health insurance benefits. We're seeing absolutely the contrary to that. And it's a risk pool problem, and it's a cost problem. And so when individual companies, particularly small firms, have to go out and buy health insurance and provide the care, they are exposing themselves to great cost and great uncertainty. And these are risks that might, this is where the trouble part comes, these are risks that might be better borne in a broader risk pool that through a larger share of the population into bigger insurance pools where that risk could be spread and would not put businesses large and small at the same degree of, of, of exposure as otherwise would be the case. I think we, we have time for a couple more questions here. Uh, I just wanted to address the prevention and education. Um, I have a eighth grader and I just noticed in looking at him and his classmates when he got into middle school that they all seem to get quite a bit bigger at that age range and I just think it has something to do with in elementary school they have playground time but they don't have that in middle school or high school and they're not even required to be in 
physical education all the time. So they have a whole lot more sedentary lifestyle starting really early. And they're not even allowed to walk around during lunch. So maybe that could be something that could be addressed. And I think that, that goes back to some of the statistics uh, uh, that uh, Dr. Buchanan pointed out about the, the, where, the where in middle school and where in the, in the uh, population age range where a lot of these uh, uh, diseases and, uh, and uh, things are starting to show up at much earlier ages. And I think there's a correlation. Yes, Thank you. Uh, my name's Ken Avent. I'm the director of the Jefferson Rural Clinic in Jefferson County. Um, and I just want to echo the, the, the sense from Dr. Murray here and other people. There is a huge chunk. We don't see anybody who's, who are, who's employed. We don't see anyone who is uh, eligible for the Affordable Care Act uh, by design. We don't do that. There are a ton of people out there who do not have access to health care, as Dr. Caparelli has said. Yes, they can go to the emergency room and they get stabilized and then they get sent out to, please, go get yourself a primary care physician. Well, that's where we come in, but you know what? We're limited by the same kinds of things. We can't provide specialist care except by referral. And Tanova has been enormously helpful to us in that regard. They're right there in Jefferson City with us. Uh, so I echo this, please expand the Affordable Care Act to those who earn below the poverty level. Uh, they are adrift. They have no access to health care other than folks like us who volunteer our services to help them. So I just emphasize that. Okay, I'll keep it brief. My name is Laura Sell, and I help people in Blount County and surrounding areas try and access um, any kind of insurance or health care coverage. And one of the things that I've learned is that less than half of the population gets health care coverage through their employer. Less than half. Okay, who does that include? Who else needs health care? Um, Part-time employees um, in low-wage jobs, construction industry and so on, they do not have access. So, if so they wait until something goes wrong and they have to end up in the emergency room or go into extreme debt. Uh, the other group of people are folks like with cancer. Um, right now, people that have breast or ovarian cancer can get help from the um, health department. Um, but the folks with other kinds of cancer, um, a lot of them can't get any help. There is no help for those so sorts of folks. So we need to take a look at those who don't fit in the large employer categories, who don't fit in the upper income categories. Um, and the other thing I would just like to say is that they mentioned mental health. A lot, it's been shown that a lot of our physical illnesses have underlying mental health components. For instance, a lot of times people that are uh, complete suicide um, go to their physical health doctor, if they have one, um, beforehand, within the two weeks before they commit suicide. And an awful lot of these problems have a an emotional or behavioral health component, and we need to be doing more to get them seen um, where both physical and emotional health issues are, are addressed. Thank you. We do have uh, another part of the program that uh, we're very excited about and, uh, and appreciate uh, these three folks uh, agreeing to participate. We've talked a lot about, uh, talked this morning a lot about uh, issues and problems and, and kind of things and we'd like, to, we'd like to end on a little bit of a high note and talk about some things that are going on in Tennessee and particularly in East Tennessee and more particularly in Knoxville that are um, some programs and activities and things that are in shape to kind of, as I've said a couple times before, to help turn this boat around and get it moving in the right direction. Uh, we're very pleased uh, to have a panel to, to help us with that conversation. Um, you. We introduced and you heard from uh, Rick Johnson from the Governor's uh, Health and Wellness Foundation earlier. We're pleased to have uh, Dr. Jack Lacey, who's the Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer here at UT Medical Center. And we're very 
fortunate and pleased to have uh, uh, the mayor of Knoxville, the Honorable Madeline Rojero, to be with us this morning as well. So uh, as we move forward on this, uh, I'm going to let these folks uh, kind of go one by one and make the comments that they'd like to make and uh, their presentations. And then again, we'll, we'll finish up with some uh, questions and answers here in a few minutes. So I think, Rick, are you going to start out? Thank you. Welcome back. Um, really, uh, thank you for being back, um, not leaving um, when you had a chance. So we're, <laughs> we're, um, we, did, we didn't lock the doors or anything, so it's, so it's great. Um, I'm going to just take a few minutes more with you and, um, uh, and talk about what we're doing across Tennessee to make this a healthier Tennessee. So um, we've all heard the problem. We got the problem. We know there's a crisis. Uh, we, we're fixers. We we're, we're make things better. We're improvers. So what are we doing? How are we going to improve this? Um, I want you to know, first of all, the governor is as aware of these statistics in this crisis as anybody is. And very, very committed to making it, uh, has made it, a, a top three priority of his administration. Along with jobs creation uh, and education, uh, health and wellness is now hit one of his top three priorities. Um, we, uh, we had good discussion in late 2012 once he said, I'm going big on this, we're going to make this a priority. How are we going to do that? How are we going to affect health outcomes in Tennessee, get this state out of the bottom ten, not accept the status quo? What's the right way to go about that? And very candidly, why do we think we can do anything about this um, that's going to uh, be any better and any more effective than what's already being done? There's a lot of work being done on, on this all across the state and have been for a while, has been for a while. Uh, and, and, and Jack and, and the mayor are going to share some of what's going on right now in Knoxville, uh, Knox County, in this area uh, with you. I'm going to start talking about what are we trying to do collectively across the state. In spite of uh, um, all of the local efforts, we still, as a state, as you've heard, are not moving in the right direction. So, so what are we doing to approach that? Um, we made some really significant fundamental decisions when we began to address this. One was, this can't just be a government program. Uh, this is something that government needs to be engaged in and lead on and be a big part of, but it can't be solved by government alone. The private sector has to be involved in this. Local community organizations have to be involved in it. This has to become a localized, strong coalition of stakeholders who are going to make this different in this state. Um, and that led to the creation uh, of the foundation. Uh, it's a 501c3 not-for-profit corporation. Uh, it was formed last year in 2013. Um, and its mission is to encourage and enable more Tennesseans to lead healthier lives. It's made up of a coalition now of more than 100 organizations, employers, uh, all the major hospital systems in the state, uh, the health insurance companies in Tennessee, uh, United Ways and Chambers of Commerce, uh, and faith-based organizations uh, all across the state. Um, it couldn't happen if we didn't have the engagement of those kinds of stakeholders, that kind of localized involvement. Um, Secondly, we decided that we could fail at a lot of this if we tried to do too, much, too many things, that we had to be focused. You've heard about the complexity of this. You know how many different ways there, uh, there are to address this, how many needs there are around this. We, did, we looked at where the numbers are. You know, we looked at the statistics I shared with you earlier this morning and said what we really have to influence are these chronic diseases that are hurting us so much and costing us so much that affect so many of us. There are six and a half million, roughly, of us Tennesseans. And the percentages I shared with you this morning say that, as a result, literally several million of us are affected by all of this. Um, the three things that are driving these chronic diseases most are lack of physical activity, uh, not getting the right amount, the right kinds of foods, and too often in too large an amount, and using tobacco. So we are focused on changing the amount of physical activity people get, uh, the kind of food they eat, and the quantity in which we eat it, uh, and uh, whether we use tobacco or not. Um, and then the set, and then the third key strategy was. How are we going to leverage this so we can get to uh, as large a number of Tennesseans as we can? 
Um, and, and that led us to be focused on workplaces, faith communities, and schools. That's the place, that, those are the places in Tennessee where most of us gather most often, where we're influenced and encouraged and helped and enabled by our peers and our leaders, uh, where we can get the leadership of those organizations to really play a significant role uh, in helping people to change behaviors. Um, those were, those were, are, were and are key fundamental ways. Engage a lot of coalition members in the private sector, not just government. Focus on three key behavior changes that drive our health conditions that affect us so, so much. Uh, and uh, focus on getting behavior change to happen when people are together, when, when, they're, when they're in community. And that's fundamentally the approach we've taken. Now, you know, it's pretty easy as we listen to all of this and we think about all the influences on our lives that are keeping us from uh, uh, having a, a healthier way of going through the world to get kind of frustrated, overwhelmed, and give up before we start. Um, and, and, and we've got to uh, figure out a way to achieve this so that's not the default position that we, that we find ourselves in. Uh, we've asked uh, a lot of questions and learned a lot as we've worked on this across the state. And uh, what we hear more often than not when we ask, why are you not leading a, a healthier life? What's in the way of that? Uh, often boil down to about five things. First of all, almost always the largest one is, I don't have time. We're all pressed for time. We're all trying to juggle so much, do so much. You know, I don't have time. Uh, after that, it's in no particular order. Uh, I can't afford it. Uh, I don't have access to it. Um, it's too complicated and hard. Or I don't know how. So if we begin all this by asking people to do something that's really expensive, takes a lot of time, very complicated and difficult, um, and, and, and hard to get to. Um, if we're asking you to change your life in that way and asking it, in, in, you know, in, involving those things, your answer is going to be no, thank you. I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, we've got to find ways to get people engaged and help them enable and encourage them to make behavior change that's related to their health in ways that will allow them to say yes. So we've taken a, a fundamental programmatic approach that's built on that, that says if Tennesseans will make small starts to change their health-related behavior and do a few more of those each day and keep doing that consistently, change their day a little bit, it will change their life over time. And that the answer to the question, will you do some of these things, is more, much more likely to be yes. Um, we began with a call to action, uh, which is start now. And I'm wearing a little pin with our, our start button. Um, start now for a healthier you and a healthier Tennessee. Um, and we, we learned and we knew from the beginning that people knew what they needed to start, what they need to do now. It's much more about how. You know, help me with the how to do that. So in addition to a messaging and awareness campaign about healthier Tennessee, um, we are also trying to provide the tools uh, in, in a free and accessible and easy to use, relatively quick way uh, to uh, answer the question, how? You know, how can I do this? It's not enough to just say do it. It's not enough to say exercise more, eat better, don't smoke. Uh, help me with that. You know, show me how. Uh, and we need to help each other with that. There are lots of good studies that say that we are, as human beings, so much more likely to change our health-related behavior if we are going about it with others. One other person in a buddy system, our coworkers, our fellow students, um, our church and faith community. Um, and uh, so the emphasis on, on having people help each other do this and do it in community uh, is, is really significant. Um, how many of you uh, have seen a, or can recall seeing, uh, a television spot for Healthier Tennessee? <laughs> Terrific, thank you. That make a, thank you, that's great. Um, and uh, any of you been to the HealthierTN.com website? Raise your hand. Good, great, thank you. So um, we're going about this with, uh, even though it is, so I can say this now because it's football time in Tennessee, we're going about this with an air game and a ground game, okay? 
And, and the air game uh, is that website and those television spots that I just talked about, along with digital uh, and, and social media, uh, to try to create awareness, but not just to create awareness, but to also engage people, to, to provide some motivation uh, and help and engagement. Uh, and that will go on, you know, for a long time. Uh, the ground game is implementation. It's about getting leaders in faith communities, schools, and workplaces to say, we're going to engage our employees. We're going to engage the members of our faith community. We're going to engage our students uh, in, in health and wellness. Uh, and we're going to provide ways uh, to let them be more active uh, and eat better uh, and abstain from tobacco and other kinds of harmful substances. Uh, and we're working strongly with implementation partners, networks of, organ in, in, of organizations and, and, and companies and, uh, uh, and institutions uh, to make that happen. Um, and uh, so uh, in that sort of uh, ground game, air game way, with those key behavior changes that we're trying to see happen, uh, and with a partnership to make it happen when people are in community, uh, we think we have a, a, a real uh, uh, excellent chance of getting Tennessee out of the bottom 10 uh, and moving the state to where we know it can be. Um, it won't happen overnight. Um, it has to happen on a number of fronts. Um, but there's a really key message that I want to leave you with and then um, well, I'm going to be here for your comments and, and questions. Um, and that is that small change leads to big and positive outcomes. Um, that we do not have to start this with the belief that if by next week or even next month or next year, uh, we haven't gotten everybody to be capable of running a marathon and losing 30% of their uh, body weight if their BMI is above a certain level uh, and uh, giving up smoking cold turkey the day after they started, then we will fail before we ever begin. Uh, there's good evidence, there's good science, there's good medicine that says incremental change related to health behaviors lead to measurable difference in, in health outcomes. Uh, there are uh, CDC studies that say that a 10% uh, reduction in body weight uh, leads to a greater than 50% reduction in the risk of becoming diabetic if your lipid profile says that you are, you are pre-diabetic. That's just one example. Um, uh, going for a walk a half an hour uh, a day, five times a week, makes measurable difference in your, in, in your biometrics and in your overall uh, health. Uh, it doesn't shield you from every possible health condition or disease that you're, you might get, but it's going to improve the quality of your life and it's going to uh, reduce your risks of certain diseases uh, and it's going to begin to take you on a road toward a healthier life. So small incremental change can add up to big positive outcomes and staying positive about that and asking people to get engaged in a way so that the answer can be yes is really uh, critical to what we're, what we're doing. Uh, and none of this is going to be possible without the, the cooperation and the collaboration and the uh, um, uh, joining together uh, that we all have to do on a localized basis in neighborhoods, in schools, in places of worship, uh, and in places of work to make, to make this happen. Thanks. Well, we've had uh, a very interesting morning so far, and um, we've learned a lot, I think, seen a lot of the challenges, and Rick, thank you uh, for what you're doing and helping initiate some answers. I appreciate that. One of the things that I, I see back here behind me, our, our flags, including our state flag, one of the things I'm reminded of is that if you look at those three stars in the center of this state flag, they historically stand for the grand divisions of our state, that today they could equally and importantly stand for health and wellness, educational advancement, and economic development. 
because in truth all these areas where we want to excel where we know we need to improve are tied together and I don't believe that we can make the progress in any one of these without making progress in all of these so I think that speaks to the depth and breadth of our op opportunity but also may give us some clues about where we begin and how we think about coming to some solutions. I want to spend uh, the next few minutes talking about a program here in Knoxville. And uh, it's one that has been in place since 2005. And it has worked to address one of the issues that's come up several times, and that's access to the healthcare system. So we've looked today at these determinants of health and we know that they all interact in a very complex way. And we have to keep in mind that those determinants, such as our individual behavior choices, also happen in a context. So it's not that because our data looks bad that we as Tennesseans are bad, but it has to do in, in no small part to the situations that we find ourselves in. So nothing about this is simple, but we have to look at the whole picture or we may get lost and not find our ultimate true path if we don't don't do that. I do want to look a little bit more about at policy making right now. So policy making at both the state and the federal level, deter especially where we're talking about determining eligibility to participate in government sponsored insurance plans can create opportunities. We had someone who spoke to the fact that our number of uninsured in the state is going down, but it can also create barriers to accessing the healthcare delivery system. And when those barriers appear, they can have some undesirable outcomes clearly. Unmet health needs, delays in receiving appropriate care, inability to get preventative health services, and hospitalizations that might have otherwise been prevented. So the current data that I've seen says that the uninsured adults with incomes at 138% of the poverty level or less in Tennessee now number nearly 400,000. And that's 22,000 in Knox County, which represents about 44% of our uninsured. So this is a significant challenge, but we've seen this challenge before. Let me take you back to 2005. At that time, we had on one day, a disenrollment of approximately 190,000 individuals, a disenrollment from 10 care. Now about 80,000 of these were in East Tennessee. So we as a community knew this was coming and the hospitals began to meet together and consider what are the options? How can we uh, continue delivery of healthcare services to all these people? And at the same time, the physician leadership of the Knoxville Academy of Medicine was meeting and considering the same tremendous challenge. So then and now, part of that answer is Knoxville Area Project Access. So CAPA or Knoxville Area Project Access was born out of a coming together of the leadership of the Knoxville Area Hospitals, UT Medical Center, Covenant Health, St. Mary's at the time and the Knoxville Academy of Medicine leadership to come together to define a model of care, then to provide the initial funding for that infrastructure, and then take a leadership role in creating a broad community uh, coalition and collaborative that could sustain this effort over time because we knew the problem of the uninsured our community was not going away. So the model that was chosen was Project Access. This was a program that had originated in Asheville, North Carolina, and had actually been brought to Tennessee first by the Hamilton Medical Society in Chattanooga. And in this program, uh, individuals who are uninsured with medical needs are identified, and there is uh, steps taken to ensure that they do not have access to an insurance program, be it public or private, and then those individuals who qualify are connected to physicians, hospitals, other providers who are willing to donate, provide without cost, these kinds of services to these neighbors who are in need. So the initial funding for the CAP effort is, as you can see here, 
and we spent $50,000 on an information system, which was really a claims paying system, because one of the tenets that we approached each other about was that we needed to make sure that everybody uh, stepped up and did their fair share, and therefore we needed to keep up with the uh, services that were provided so that we could distribute the opportunity to serve our neighbors in need was shared by all. So this was the initial coalition, and you see on here city and county governments as well as our Knox County Health Department, and then other providers in our community, providers of mental health services, our Interfaith Health Clinic, and Cherokee Health Systems, fairly qualified clinics. And this was our mission statement, to improve the overall health of the community by creating access to a complete system of health care for those without access to health care coverage. Significant challenge. The mantra was that if every physician, every physician group, every hospital, in fact, every health care stakeholder, and we included everybody in our community in that group, everybody has a stake in our health care, uh, that if everybody does their fair share, then no one will be overburdened and we can actually make some headway here. So this is kind of the picture of what we were doing. We identified community members with health care needs. We screen those to make sure that they don't have access to some other health care program or insurance pro program. And then we approve them for a limited amount of time so that they can get their specific health care need addressed. We refer them to providers, which included a strong and ongoing effort on our part to get these folks into a primary care home. And we've really had great success in this arena but also to specialists and hospital care and other needed health care services, including pharmacy. So CAPA connects people who have a need, who are eligible to have that need met by this program with those who are willing to donate those health care services. So this was the scope of care. And again, this is Knox County. This won't work in Scott County in this way and in many areas in our state. But in Knox County, we had the availability, the access, and the willingness of, of this scope of services to step up and begin to address this problem. Our eligibility guidelines, I mentioned, we were serving Knox County residents. The, the individual served could not have access to a health insurance, either public or private. And they had to have a household income at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. So when a, a patient uh, was enrolled, they were assigned to a CAPA care manager. And this care manager coordinated all the medical services for this, this individual. So if they needed to see a primary care doctor, that connection was made. And then if they needed to see a cardiologist next, that connection was made, so on and so forth. And the CAPA manager was not only responsible for making these connections, but also for helping the patients navigate the healthcare system effectively and also providing lifestyle education, uh, education about how the individual can increasingly become self-sufficient or at least take a, a role, a significant role in their own care outcomes. Our current uh, physician and provider network includes 1,150 physicians and ph physician extenders in all of the Knox County hospitals. And again, when we began this, we said that each uh, physician, each hospital, uh, if, as they step up, will be asked to do their fair share. So each cap of physician and other providers uh, tell us how many folks that they can see on an annual basis. And if they say we can see five, we're very grateful. If they say they can see 55, we're ecstatic. But we've made this work and we, we negotiate these to some degree, and if, if we go beyond the limit, we respect it, but we do try to get help beyond the, the number of patients that uh, have been, they've been willing to see. So we, again, we keep track of the patients seen and the donated care by each physician and by each hospital, and we are very transparent about that, and we try to balance this out so, again, everybody has the opportunity to do their fair share. Now these are our current partners, circa 
2014. And the ones in orange are those folks who are partic participating with us uh, in the care arena, but also those who are helping fund this activity. So what are the outcome of this CAP activity? What have we seen since 2005, 2006 with this effort? Well, we've enrolled over 18,000 Knox County residents into health care services through this program. And we've coordinated over $125 million in donated medical services. We know this again because those who are providing care submit a bill to us. They don't receive payment, but that's how we keep up with who's doing what and what this total is. And in this, we've coordinated 80,000 medical encounters. So what's the return on investment? To date, the total funding for CAPA has been $4.8 million. And, $4 million. and that's come as in forms of state safety grants and in other grants and gifts. Again, the total donated care, $125 million. So basically, there's been a 25 to 1 return on investment for this activity. There's another outcome that I think is important because we think we're creating better health care citizens through this process. The CAPA case managers offer the patients tools and education to make them, uh, again, better users of the system and also better informed and able to make better decisions about their own health. When our enrollees first enter the program, accepted into the program, they have to sign a responsibility contract and they're held accountable for the appropriate use of the healthcare system rather than charge to fee. We had a long debate about this when we first created CAPA. Should we charge a copay, a $5 copay? Because many felt that paying anything towards the health care received would increase the respect that that, of, of that uh, health care and would make folks be more likely to do what they were asked to do, take their medicines, keep their appointments, et cetera. In the end, we found that we decided what we really want was people who um, we will treat with respect, we'll sign a contract with them, and if they abuse it, because this is donated care, they put that care at risk. And what we've seen has been phenomenal. We've had, and, and we have the data to back that up, that we've had an extremely known rate of emergency room inappropriate use by our enrollees, much less than commercial uh, payers are seeing. So treating these people with respect, holding them accountable, having them put a name on a document that says, I will keep my appointments, I will follow my doctor's directions, etc. I will not misuse the emergency room, has really worked. And I think that says a lot about the people that we're serving. Another outcome has been the development of what I think will be an increasingly important um, area of expertise in our community, and that is the community case management services. Currently, we're coordinating transportation for low-income dialysis patients. We're co coordinating detox treatment for homeless, drug-addicted individuals, and providing case management for non-emergent but frequent emergency room users. So we've tried to stay relevant and um, uh, meet the community's needs in any way that we, we can see. And um, I think that one of the things that we heard earlier, again, Dr. Caparelli, about access to subspecialists has come up several times. And again, within, within Knox County, we, we have significant resources, as do the other metropolitan areas. Not, not the case when you move away from the major metropolitan areas. Our model. Uh, is at risk from the standpoint that um, we rely on grants for our funding. We have to apply for those grants every year. The good thing is we have to prove our, our worth every year. The data says whether or not we're worthy of continuing those grants, and we, and we have been. And so that's, that's a good thing. We're held accountable as an organization. But um, the other issue that we face is as our hospitals and as our doctors who are donating this, these millions of dollars of care uh, are under, put under increasing financial pressure themselves, 
can we maintain this level of service and provide this level of care to all those uninsured who are in our in our community. So those are challenges that we face ahead. Thank you all. Yay. I was afraid I was going to have to figure that out myself. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, good morning. It is still morning. <laughs> And we're moving right along, and I have really enjoyed every panel that I've listened to and statements from the audience as well, and it's an honor to be on this panel with Rick Johnson and, and Dr. Lacey. So I'm going to talk about uh, what one community in our region is doing, what the city of Knoxville is doing to try and address some of these issues that have been so effectively laid out today. You know, for an elected official, community health is one of those issues that can be a bit maddening. We can measure it, we can see where the challenges are, but we don't have easy solutions. And we can't legislate cholesterol levels or body mass indexes, but we still have to address the problem. So, um, and, and I feel like we still have a great responsibility to encourage and to promote a healthier, happier lives for our citizens. So Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. often talked about the beloved community. It's a phrase I love, it's a term that I love. And a beloved community is one in which all people can share in the, in the wealth of the earth, a, a community in which poverty and hunger and homelessness is not tolerated. And certainly a beloved community is also a healthy community where everybody has the knowledge and means necessary to achieve good health. None of us can do it alone, as, as we've heard all morning. That's why I want to talk about the value of partnerships. And in the civic arena, health is very much a team effort. When you hear the health data for our region and our state, it can be dispiriting. But we have to be honest about it. The problems are real, and they have serious consequences. And we can't just throw up our hands. And we have it in our area. That's the point we've heard. Dr. Lacey talked about CAPA. We've talked about some of the different partnerships. We have a real explosion of efforts here in recent years to grapple seriously with these issues. Each of these logos that you see here represents collaborative work by many different organizations inside and outside of government to improve the health of our community. And I'm going to talk about those uh, more in a minute, but I want to first talk about some, well, some of the things that we have done under the jurisdiction of the City of Knoxville with the Parks and Recreation Department, and I see our Director of Parks and Recreation, Joe Walsh, is here with us today. So we have parks and recreation facilities uh, throughout our city. You can see some of the numbers here, 60 major parks, 12 recreation centers, five swimming pools, uh, all of which, by the way, are very popular destinations. Uh, we have a skateboard park. We have, and we really work to promote uh, youth and adult sports leagues, golf, tennis, disc golf, uh, skateboarding. I mean, a lot of alternative sports as well. We try to get our kids and, and, uh, and uh, families engaged in. Our recreation centers run after school and summer programs for children, which includes games and fitness activities, along with a nutrition program. Then there are the 85 miles of greenways and trails, which we're adding to every year. I think this past budget, we put a million dollars into, into greenways. So uh, in fact, we're adding a section over near here uh, by the river, which is planned to be a greenway that will ultimately connect downtown Knoxville all the way south to Blount County. We also work with great partners. For example, the County Health Department, Dr. Buchanan and her staff, guides the nutrition program at our recreation centers. And this photo uh, at the top uh, is a ribbon cutting that we just did last week for a new playground at Chilhowee Park uh, on Magnolia Avenue. It was built by volunteers for the Muse, which is, you know, the Muse is the, the uh, Children's Discovery Center that is now located at the park. The picture of the, children, of the child swimming, uh, that's the swimming pool at our E.V. Davidson Community Center in East Knoxville, which is now being managed by the Emerald Youth Foundation, and so they can provide swimming lessons to the young people that they uh, serve. So another um, 
I think I just pulled the wrong page. Here we go. So we're also part of a national Let's Move fitness program for children. This is the program started um, by First Lady Michelle Obama to counter childhood obesity. Our Parks and Recreation Department teamed up with the school system, health department, and others probably in this room to meet a set of goals around fitness and nutrition awareness. This has included things like posting nutritional information in school cafeterias and recreation centers, increasing opportunities for children's physical play, and increasing participation in the school breakfast and lunch programs. There's also a big Let's Move event every year where kids from across the, the county come out to play and compete. And let's not forget the very cool dance that Beyonce developed called the Let's Move dance that the kids across the county are learning. And, uh, the mayor has learned it too. Well, I'm trying to learn it. Uh, I try, I try. But it's, um, y'all should try it, Google it, look, go, look at, uh, for it on YouTube. But really gets you up out of your seat and gets you active. And so there's some good news to all the bad data that we've heard. In 2013, Knoxville and Knox County ranked number one in the country for meeting the goals of the Let's Move program. So we should be proud of that. <laughs> Another important project, which I know Dr. Lacey and, and many others in this room have been involved in, is the Together Healthy Knox uh, initiative. It formed in 2010 with representatives from the city, the county, the healthcare community, the school system, and many other stakeholders. I was one of the early members. This was an effort to bring all these different parties together and to come up with the quantitative side of all of this, really assessing community health, using all of our available data to identify challenges and strategies. And this is just a page from the initial community health assessment back in 2010. This group issued a report in August, which you can read online at healthynox.org, that outlined a lot of goals. Two of the largest were to identify more specific actions to be taken and to bring more partners into the effort. Together Healthy Knox is continuing as a project of the Community Health Council, and they're working on an updated community health assessment. Outdoor Knoxville is another great partnership that has, um, be, that has formed in our area. It's between the Legacy Parks Foundation, the city's a partner, Appalachian Mountain Bike Club, and many of, the, of our outdoor recreation groups and retailers and uh, just uh, other folks in town who love being outdoors. Carol Evans at Legacy Parks really spearheaded Outdoor Knoxville a few years ago as a way to capitalize on the, our growing urban wilderness in South Knoxville. I hope you all know about that. It's been mentioned, I think Rhonda mentioned that earlier. And on the overall uh, opportunities and growth of opportunities for outdoor recreation in our region. You know, we used to think of ourselves, or we used to identify ourselves as a place where people stopped on the way to get to the Smoky Mountains, right? <laughs> well now, you don't have to go to the Smoky Mountains to get outside and to really enjoy nature. Outdoor Knoxville, um, what we've discovered is all of the great outdoor assets that we have right here under our noses. Our greenways, our undeveloped hi uh, hills, ridges, and ravines in South Knoxville, that is our urban wilderness. Our parks, our Iams Nature Center, our quarries, and even our Blue Way, our big Blue Way, the Tennessee River. Outdoor Knoxville serves several functions. It's partly a tourism and economic development calling card. Uh, outdoor recreation is a booming industry nationally and across the state, so this gives us a chance to be a part of that. And at the Outdoor Knoxville Adventure Center that you see up here in this picture, you can go there and you can rent kayaks and stand up paddle boards and bicycles so you can get out on our greenways and, uh, and, our, and our blueways and be active. We know from our partners at the Chamber that businesses look, looking to relocate or expand often look for outdoor amenities because they make this a more attractive place to live and work. But Outdoor Knoxville is also a community health strategy. By promoting Knoxville as an active community, a place full of hikers and cyclists and paddlers, we are changing how people think about the city and the region. It encourages everyone to get outside, get into the woods or onto the trails. To become a healthy community, you have to have an image of what a health community, healthy community looks like. 
and outdoor Knoxville gives us that image. And I have to say from the city's perspective, we also are putting a lot more money into adding sidewalks, into adding bike lanes. The city council just adopted our proposal for a complete streets policy, which means that our default is that any time we build or rebuild a road, we are looking to make it a complete street with sidewalks, bike lanes, transit opportunities. Our roads... <laughs> Our philosophy is our roads are not to move cars, our roads are to move people in all the alternative ways that people should be moving. <laughs> So uh, walkability uh, and also just making the streetscapes more attractive so people want to get out and, and be active. So then of course there's the food and nutrition side of the equation which we've heard about. We know that healthy eating is one of the absolute keys to a healthy city. We also know that in a lot of areas of our city, people do not have easy access to healthy food choices. We have food deserts all over Knoxville. There are some positive trends, however. The Market Square Farmer's Market, which you can see at the top, just celebrated the tenth an their 10th anniversary. Other far farmer's markets have sprung up all over uh, the city and our region. It's great to see families out shopping together with the kids learning where food actually does come from. <laughs> In the city, we're also trying to encourage more urban agriculture and permaculture to let people grow and sell from small plots right in their own neighborhoods. And we had to address some, some of our legal uh, and regulatory policies, and right now our law department, Office of Sustainability, and other staff are working on that so that we can promote community gardens. One of the most successful examples of this is Beardsley Community Farm in Mechanicsville which is run by the Knoxville Knox County Community Action Committee, CAC. It has a dual mission of both agriculture and education. And you can see a group of children here uh, that are learning about compost. Admittedly, these are almost, by definition, small-scale efforts, but each one of them can make a difference in a given neighborhood, and they contribute to a growing awareness of health and nutrition. So finally, the last point that I want to make is what it says on this slide. Leadership matters. Here, Governor Haslam and I literally rolled up our sleeves uh, to encourage people to get flow shots at the health department. I also have taken a mouth swab test for HIV on stage in front of an assembly of UT students during sex week uh, last year at UT. <laughs> So all of us in leadership positions need to be out there uh, talking to people about health issues, encouraging people to get active and take charge of their health, leading by example when necessary. We've also teamed up with CAPA, Tennessee Healthcare Campaign, both of which have been mentioned, and other local groups to encourage people to get enrolled in health insurance under the Affordable Care Act. And I've also joined with the other um, um, big city mayors, uh, Memphis, Nashville, Chattanooga, you may have seen our editorial, our uh, op-ed in the paper. Uh, we did that last year when the enrollment first started and then again now to encourage people. And there are a number of events that are being held. If you, if you haven't seen that in the paper, call 311 or go to the City of Knoxville website. We're listing all the events in the region where people in our region can enroll in the Affordable Care Act. So we encourage you to help uh, help educate people about that. As a local leader, I have a responsibility to let people know, here is the law and here is what is available to you. And I want the people in Knoxville to know their options and to choose what is best for themselves and their families. So I think the overall message is, yes, these issues are big and they're complicated, but by working together with many partners, we are really trying to address the challenges of community health from many different angles. So thanks to all of you who are working on this issue, and I pledge that the city will continue to work with you as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amanda Weber with Remote Area Medical. 
Um, and during 16 days of service in five of the counties that we're discussing um, in this region today, um, RAM clinics provided dental services to 2,500 individuals and eyeglasses to 1,700 people. This is unfortunately a drop in the bucket um, to what we know is needed. We know that dental and vision uh, problems are, pose serious obstacles to employment, and they're often indicators of more serious problems. Um, even with the focus on prevention, um, dental and vision services are not included in the ACA, um, and they're often add-ons to insurance policies. So my question is, how do we come together as communities, employers, nonprofits, and government agencies to address this part of the problem in the healthcare crisis in Tennessee? Yeah, I, th I think locally that uh, I agree, and, and I, we're aware of that. I think we have to develop greater access to dental care. Uh, we have a, a dental residency here at this hospital. There are opportunities like that that we have to take advantage of and expand. But, but I totally agree. If you can't eat and you can't see, it's hard to work. So I think you're right. And I think uh, one, of the, one other issue that I've observed in Nashville is that, that uh, people in our delegation and, and Dr. Ramsey uh, uh, from Blount County has been a, uh, on the health committee and a leader in this is looking at those things where there are gaps and how do we fill those in and as, as policies and laws are created, every time there's something new put on the books, there's always the unintended consequence and whether it was whether it just sort of happened that way, but uh, we do have a group of folks uh, on our health committees and our elected offices that do look at those things and how do we tweak them and fix those deficiencies that, that come up not necessarily by design but more by accident and uh, so forth. So I think those things are being looked at and will be as we go forward with, with uh, legislation and other things that are on the books. Um, I totally agree. Vision and dental are huge gaps. Uh, one of the things that um, is going on here in Knox County is to address the issue of access to dental care for children. Uh, you can imagine learning is really hard if, you t if your teeth are hurting or if you have an abscess. Um, so Knox County Schools is partnering with an uh, organization called the Elgin Foundation to increase access for kids who might not otherwise have it for dental care. So I'm encouraged by those efforts. Small but you know, small steps will get us there. I'm Linda Rust. I work for the city of Knoxville, and we recently have um, done a community survey of needs. And we're getting phone calls, and we're hearing from people um, about the recent news with the Tanova Hospital moving. Um, location is really key. Uh, to uh, health care access and we have concerns uh, about people who live in lower income communities in East and North Knoxville having uh, access to care. Um, these are communities that are lower income, um, that have more um, elderly subsidized housing, they have more organizations um, that serve people who are homeless, and um, more subsidized housing residents as well. So these are people who are definitely, as we've seen through the um, data that you've shown us today, at higher risk of poor out health outcomes. They're also people who um, have less access for transportation. Um, so I'm concerned about uh, Tenova relocating. I'm concerned about news that there's a major pharmacy, maybe the only one on Magnolia Avenue in East Knoxville that may be closing. Um, so I don't know if it's really so much a question as just a concern. Thank you. I think, again, as we move along and we look at these things and the consequences of, of these, how do we fill in those gaps? Uh, Dr. Lacey mentioned that, that uh, one of the uh, things with Kappa is looking at transportation and those things. So those are all duly noted. And uh, as we move forward with conversations and, and looking at those things, those will all be taken into consideration. Um, again, I want to, um, I'm going to ask Mr. Landsman to make some final comments here in just a second, but I do want to thank you all again for coming. One housekeeping thing, if you parked in our garage, if you'll just identify to the attendant that you were here for the Community Health Forum, they should open the gate and, and, and let you leave. But again, we appreciate uh, the folks who've been on our various panels this morning uh, for their contributions to the program, and thank you for attending. But I now call on Mr. Landsman. Thank you, sir. Uh, join me in thanking all of our panelists again. They did a great job.
So all leaders at some point in their career or careers learn the value of a burning platform. So I'm going to give you the burning platform, not as a, not in a, in a way, not in an effort to um, create more concern, but to, as a call to action. So our nation today is spending spending in excess of 17 percent of our GDP on healthcare services. 17 percent. For the first time in our history, all of the economists in all the different industry sectors are aligned on one thing, and that is if it climbs to closer to 20 percent, that's not much of an increase, it will cause a catastrophic meltdown of the nation's economy. Take that to Tennessee, being in the lowest, our health status being in the lowest 10 states in the nation, it is a concern. I know that raising the issue is the right thing to do, that's how you start. Embracing the issue and working together, together on a very complex, very broad <coughs> issue that's going to require a multi-dimensional solution. But working together, I know we can get there and we'll start to move the needle. It's not going to happen overnight. We didn't get here overnight. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take energy. It's going to take money. But we can do it. And we can ensure the future of the state of Tennessee and all of us who live in this state. So I thank you for being here. John told you how to get out of jail free. Um, and uh, we look forward to working together to, to address these issues. Thank you all.